we have all the time in the world, but you don't have to wait any longer for episode 006 of A Review to a Kill, which is a look back on the James Bond film franchise presented to you by fanboysanonymous.com. I am Tony Mango. I've got with me Robert E. Felice. There's no time to die. <laughs> Different movie. <laughs> and Callum Wiggins. Uh, sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> Took me a second. <laughs> So what we're doing here is we are rolling along here. We've done all the films leading up to this point, obviously. So go back and check them out if you want to kind of continue on with this journey with us. Because we are currently on On Her Majesty's Secret Service. The longest title out of all these uh, films. The most awkward title out of all of them. And one of my uh, ones that I don't like saying all that much. So for probably most of this, I'm going to short it in the way that I always used to short it osmosis which is a completely different word unrelated at all to the movie but it's a lot better than saying on her majesty's secret service or ohmss that's moses so i really thought you were saying omas the other day (laughs) (laughs) aj styles his bodyguard we're gonna run down the typical stuff we've been doing here the girls the gadgets the villains the allies the action the humor the music and everything else in between go through the movie from top to bottom and everything and we want you to tell us your thoughts in the comments below So go ahead and do that just to get the plugs out of the way as well. If you are putting those comments on YouTube, make sure that you are uh, subscribed to the YouTube channel here and ring that little notification bell. That way you're aware of when these go live. It's usually Friday mornings or so. Maybe that's going to get switched up a little bit here and there, but at least when you get those email alerts, you'll know when they do get posted. Hit the like button as well. If you like the video to help us grow a little bit with the SEO share, if you have any friends that might be interested in this uh, franchise, if you want to donate to the Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash fanboys anonymous and help this uh, series and the channel and fanboys anonymous in general in the future. Even a dollar is greatly appreciated and $10 and up gives you access to the dark casts. And I've been trying to think of what we could do for like a, a bond dark cast type of thing. So if you have any suggestions about that, drop them in the comments below, maybe talk about the video games or something like that. And we're going to, have uh, the options of pick your poison as well. Uh, that could apply to a, re- a review to a kill. Even maybe you want us to do Casino Royale from the old one, or you know, we might get around to doing some different things here and there. I don't know, but you can make sure that we do something like that by taking advantage of the pick your poison tier, and you can pick up some merchandise on T Public and Redbubble. And I will go back and do some other plugs later on, but I don't want to bog this down too much because I want to get into the movie. And unfortunately, I do not have foreign language titles for this one that made me crack up like 007 uh, infiltrates the rocket base or whatever it was for the other thing. Um, This one, the only one I could find really that was anything just other than a translation of on her majesty's secret service was the queen's 007 for Japan. I'm trying to make that a regular thing though, checking up the foreign language titles because some of them do get a little bit funky. I'm pretty sure like Moonraker probably has some fun ones. And I think we need to just start things off a little bit. Uh, by just addressing the elephant in the room, and it's not Barry, it's uh, George. Because <laughs> Connery, during the last one, we established he does not want to be Bond anymore. He's over it. He's over the producers. He's over the idea of being hounded by the, uh, the press and everything. Connery's just basically like, fuck that. And one of the people that they considered replacing him with was Timothy Dalton who was only 22 at the time, which is kind of weird. And he said, I'm a little bit too young. Credit to him. George Lazenby was 29 for this movie. So we do get a younger Bond. And one of the other people that they really, really considered for this was Adam West. I love this idea so much. <laughs> I have not heard it, and now that I have, I love it. I have not seen any screen test material or anything. I really want to see it really badly. But he turned it down mostly because he thought Bond should always be played by an Englishman. I appreciate that, and he's correct, but still, God, that would have been amazing. Well, George Lazenby is Australian. And... <laughs> uh <laughs> So it's kind of, I know a lot of people confuse uh, the Australian accent and a more like British accent. You can tell uh, if you pay any attention, which one's which, but it is kind of, you know, 
Um, there were there were times during the movie where it was pretty evident when he slipped into the Australian accent every now and again. He doesn't Can't even do his that. own voice in the movie for parts of it. Well, no, yeah. <laughs> the, I, I for for about five minutes, I was wondering whether it was actually just the guy that was playing Sir Hillary talking over him. <laughs> And then it clicks like, yeah, it has to be the guy that's totally talking yeah. over him because he wouldn't be able to maintain it as well as he has been doing. But yeah. Does it upset it, you it, when it, people it, get the Australian and UK thing mixed up in general? Nobody, like other people? Well, nobody outside of ignorant Americans don't. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, don't know. I, I don't know many ignorant Americans apart from, you know, the ones Us. that are <laughs> <laughs> um, So Lazenby was a car salesman and a part-time model, not at all an actor. It kind of shows. Uh, <laughs> but how he got the role was he went to the place that Connery got his haircut, got a haircut like Connery, went to the place that Connery had his suits and got a suit that Connery would have gotten, bought a Rolex like Connery would have worn, and basically walked into the office and was like, don't I look like Bond? And they were like, yeah, yeah. you want the part? <laughs> I totally disagree with this idea that that's how you should cast the role. And I will go on record of saying George is my least favorite Bond by far. I didn't mind him. He'll probably end up being my least favorite. It's it was it was fine. I thought there were there were some parts of this movie that I, I very much enjoyed, but then there, like knowing that this is his only film, I didn't get too attached. So I just looked at it as a novelty. I kind of, I kind of went in with the perspective that I thought this was going. He was going to be just stick out like a sore thumb as not being a very good Bond, and I kind of came out of the movie thinking I would like to have seen him have another go. Me too, though. I, I, he is my least favorite, but I think if he would have been because he didn't have another, he ha- had option uh, to do the part longer. They signed him on for I think it was like a six part film, maybe a seven part contract or something, and he showed up at the premiere with this long beard and long shaggy hair and dressed like a hippie and all this. And his agent was basically like, well, I don't think that you should stick around because the bond franchise is too old and it's going to be passe. So you should just quit already (laughs) after one movie. Can you imagine somebody saying, Oh, the bond movies are kind of old hat. They'll never stick around. And then you skip to 20 films later. (laughs) (laughs) You know, so I do think that maybe he would have grown into the part a lot better over time and he could have been pretty good, you know, in some of the circumstances. I think that he's better, for instance, in the action part than Connery. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that he was more active and more animated in the action sequences. I think he was funnier than Connery was as well. I think that, again, that's mainly due to the writing side of things more than the actual uh, delivery of the stuff but I think that some of the lines that he put together or presented were actually got me to crack a smile more than a lot of bon- uh, Connery's ones were which are a bit more uh, deadpan which I think is obviously more in tune with the character that he was portraying but I did kind of appreciate that aspect of Lazen B's attempt at Bond. I appreciate the fact they're different Bonds you can tell they're very different yeah, and this like sets a... all the all the bonds going forward. It's just like they're not just trying to play the same character. They're it's, diff- it's different guys with different interpretations of the character. Yeah, they they're doing some of the tropes, obviously, and they're hitting some of the same beats. But at the same time, you know, if you're going to say like who's the funny Bond, it's more who's the suave, sophisticated type of Bond. It's more of like. A cross between like a Brosnan and like a Connery. Uh, the more sensitive one is definitely Brosnan. The more uh, cold blooded bastard one is Dalton. Even though Craig is like, I'd say I'd say Craig is the sadistic one. <laughs> Craig's like, uh, I mean, we'll talk about this when we get to Casino Royale. I mean, Craig's the they literally call him a blunt instrument, and he bursts through a wall. <laughs> So he's he's the more brutal, like brute of the bunch. But I think Connery is the more one that uh, not Connery. Um, Dalton's the more likely to like assassinate somebody. He's like he's more of a prick in some ways. Connery's way more of a prick than Lazenby is, and it's the nature of the film too. The the film's by far one of the more romantic ones of the bunch, so they have to lessen him down a little bit. Uh, 
generally speaking, before we get into bit by bit of the movie, this is, if not my least favorite movie of the series, it's at the very least one of the bottom three. I do not like On Her Majesty's Secret Service. And I, it was one of the ones I was really looking forward to watching the most because I, I might have seen this one the least out of the bunch. It's this one, Dr. No, and actually, yeah, it's this one, Dr. No, and For Your Eyes Only are the three that I've seen the least. And I just don't typically revisit. Even something like Octopussy, I've watched a lot more. And I was really disappointed because I was like, you know, I liked Dr. No more than I remembered. Still low on the list, but I liked it more. And this one, I was like, I, I might walk away with this one really liking it. And partway through, I'm just like, damn it, I still don't like it. <laughs> How are you guys on this in, in a general sense? It's not going to be like, it's not going to take the top spot or anything. But I didn't think it was as bad. And obviously, it's above Dr. No, because Dr. No is probably going to keep the bottom spot forever. And don't want to say this with any measure of a hyperbole or going over the top. But I think this movie is a masterpiece. <laughs> no, I, I, no, no, it's it's it weird. Is, this movie I is very. So mu- yeah, I, I just had I had so much fun watching this movie. And it was I, was, I see the time. I see that it's going to be two and a half hours. And I know that Laban B's the bond in it. So I just assume it's going to be bad. And maybe that slightly steered it for me. But this movie is just so well written and so well put together in every single aspect outside the fact that maybe you could have picked a bit more sturdy, robust actor to play Bond. But outside of that, I just thought it was, it's, it's better than any other Bond movie that I've seen so far in this series. This and movie is this. one of the most controversial ones because it really is basically you love it or you hate it. And a lot of people, this is far and above their favorite. Like uh, Christopher Nolan loves this movie and you can see influences with like Inception. Have you guys both seen Inception? Not yes. in a while. Uh, and for anybody who hasn't seen the movie, I won't spoil much, but uh, one of the climactic action sequences is on a mountain uh, mountainside in the snow. And he has gone on record of saying like, yeah, this is like part of my homage to osmosis. And I can appreciate some elements of this movie really, really well, but there are some parts of this that I absolutely despise. And that's what kills it for me. That, that, I mean, there is one or two aspects that I really find disappointing. Obviously, it keeps it away from being like all time great classic movie for me. But I think I'm more inclined to, especially with this one, because I have such low expectations going into it. The positives were really accentuated to me. I just think that with the Connery stuff, Connery's a better bond than Langston. Don't get me wrong with that side of things. But I just think that if Connery had this writing behind him and this... Mm-hmm direction and these the the better like setting and i think it was just it's so much it's, the way that it's structured is so much more fluid and so much more point a to point b to point c all the way all the way through than i think any of the other bond movies which are a bit more i don't say disjointed but they don't feel they don't feel as te- they're telling as complete a story as this one is i'm gonna we're gonna have lots of debates I'm sure throughout this, <laughs> which I I'm, I'm finding really fun. Um, I'm going to start things off though with, uh, I guess the beginning, cause why not? Uh, they decide to go back to what they did with Dr. No with the gun barrel, which was to stop it midway through to say Harry Saltzman and Albert R. Broccoli present already. That's a ding for me. I don't like that. It's not the biggest thing in the world. It's a nitpick, but it's one of those things where it's like, mm, don't like it. Not sure why they did that. I think that's one of those things that speaks to your fandom because, yeah, it was different, but I hardly noticed, you know? Yeah. I'm much more of a nitpicker when it comes to that stuff. And we go to Q and M talking about one of the only gadgets in this movie, and it doesn't get used, radioactive lint. (laughs) Like, all right, whatever. Money Penny doesn't know where Bond is either. Nobody knows where Bond is. They want to try to track him or whatever. And Bond is on this winding road and a pretty girl in a red car passes by him. 
And that is not the last time that those specific set of details happens in the franchise <laughs> of pretty girl in red car passes Bond on a winding road because it happens in Goldeneye. <laughs> Well, if they keep that up as well, I kind of I, I like the start of it because it shows you three familiar characters before you get introduced to Lazenby. Mm-hmm. So it, it gives you like the little swathe of okay, this is still the Bond franchise. We still have these characters that you you know and love at this point, but you're going to be going to have to basically adjust yourself a little bit to realize oh, you're not going to be watching Connery in this one. You're going to be watching someone else. So I appreciated that. This is one of those things that's 50-50 for me because I love that they toy with this, but I think that they I'm, – I'm going to mention like six different points that are on the same thing, so we'll keep going back to this. But they – and I listened to um, the commentary as well. The director flat out is talking about how like, well, we wanted to play up this idea of not showing his face here and not showing this, whatever. And then in other ways, they seem to just go, well, yeah, but then we'll completely undermine that point. But I do like the start of it like that. Yeah, I mentioned to you when I had first watched it that I really enjoyed the way that they started this and how, you know, right off the bat, you have Lazenby going, oh, well, that never happens to the other guy. Oh, we got, you said that. I got like six notes before we even get to that point. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. <laughs> but we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, in his glove compartment, they show the folded out sniper rifle from From Us With Love. So it's another nod. Hey, same guy. And he uses the scope to look at a girl. We don't know at this point who she is. We, we'll get to know that she's Tracy. Yep, sounds and, like Bond so far. Yeah, you know, it's just like, hey, hey, there's a babe, that kind of thing. And she's just casually walking into the water with this beautiful dress on. The implication being supposedly that she's trying to commit suicide. But to be honest, I don't feel like that is so imminently noticeable that it requires Bond speeding on the uh the beach and going to rescue her she literally looks like she's kind of taking a stroll and there's no information that sets this up and they never call back to it i hate that they call back to it once and just in something that she says but i do agree with you that the bond shouldn't know like the urgency that he shows doesn't match what she was doing he just happened to i guess have a hunch that hey this woman is in danger my pussy senses are tingling or whatever (laughs) it's still like you know i know what can stop her (laughs) (laughs) i think that at least from my perspective when i was watching it there's a there's a a, an established established accord that he knows who this woman is and he's been i don't say tracking her for a while but he's been involved with her or he's been surrounded by her at different points in time because he knows what her name is when they talk later in the uh, casino and stuff like that without her saying at any point in time so he knows who she is doesn't somebody give her her name and give him her name i don't think so because i, th- I think it. somebody says that and then so, she gives him because she has she goes by multiple names in the movie she's yeah. tracy but she's teresa uh, contessa teresa di vincenzo and <laughs> uh technically she's like teresa draco and uh, so like, I think this is one of those things that like I nitpick, but I also think it's more than a nitpick. I think for instance, a rewrite on this movie changes things around where she doesn't pass by bond and he just sees that or whatever that we see bond has found the girl he's looking for and she's doing this. Then you go, okay, bond knows that she's going to try to kill herself, whoever she is. Yeah, it, it could, you, you could make it slightly clearer like that. I don't want to be against that side of things. I just don't think that it takes away from it in my mind. I feel like it's a it's a more it's a more unique introduction to the Bond girl with this. And just as like an overarching thing with the Bond girl, I'm so happy that we meet the Bond girl that's basically with Bond the entire movie in the first scene. Yeah. <laughs> and and is there pretty much throughout. It that was a massive uptick for me on any other Bond movie because it means that we have a chance to actually get to know this girl. See, I'm also going to talk about how I, I don't like that. They screw that up though. Cause they just, they, she disappears midway through the movie. Uh, Again, I'll I'll probably try and defend that point because I don't think that's too much of an issue because bonds in a completely different location. I don't really mind that side of it too much. 
Um, so I, I feel like that's an incomplete scene, but we get uh, the introduction and the full face shot of him. Uh, and he introduces himself in a way that I don't really like, just his, the way his delivery was. He's like, my name's Bond, James Bond. <laughs> he's just kind of like, ah, I'm him, that guy, you know. <laughs> I, I'll I grant what, you that. I didn't like the way he introduced himself. I would have wanted, like, if I were the director, I'd be like, "Can you do a couple more takes of that?" I, I don't, I don't feel it. I feel like you're a guy doing a Bond parody and not Bond. Um, and he's immediately attacked by a couple goons who try to wrangle her up. They put a knife and a gun on them, and uh, Bond, one of the guys, wants Bond to lay down in a canoe or a boat or whatever. And this awkward fight sequence starts where we're back to speeding up the shots and having that burn kind of trumpet blaring, which I find obnoxious. I would agree. I don't like some of the earlier fights in this movie. I, I thought the fight was very, it, it seemed more active and animated. I know obviously they wouldn't have speed up scene. There's the, the one major pet peeve I have in this entire movie above all else is the excessive camera cuts which yeah. happens throughout this entire thing, which is, again, as a WWE fan, I've gone used to to an extent, really, but it's just like, but it is just over the top in this movie. But I just like the fact that this Bond looks like he's really, can really Hitting. do stuff in a fight. Yeah, yeah he can, yeah, he can yeah. really do stuff in a fight rather than, Connery's ones were far more, I mean, uh, I don't want to tell it's a knock on Connery because I like the fact that Connery's ones are a bit more clumsy and all over, all over the place, really. He feels like he's thinking on his feet constantly, whereas this guy looks like it's a more choreographed routine. But then again, choreographed fighting stunt routines are fun, can be fun in their own right as well, and I really enjoyed these ones as well. Yeah, but he does look like he is a much more fit, active... Yeah, it looks like, like this is the guy that's actually doing it, not a, not a stuntman that's being brought up. Although I assume there were certain parts where he did get a stuntman involved in it as well. Yeah. And the director, by the way, uh, he was the editor on um, that they had brought in for You Only Live Twice. And then they, they were like, hey, why don't you be the director for this? He actively was like, let me try to do different things all the time. So the editing being cutting all over the place and speeding things up and doing this is him just being like, let me do 1500 different types of filmmaking and cram it all into the movie. So that's why there's like some disjointed stuff that I don't like in there. Not that I would have liked them to be like, well, we'll speed up everything because – I don't like that at all, but I wish that they would have been like, let's not experiment with each scene. Let's have a cohesiveness to it a little bit better. But Tracy runs off and Bond is left with her shoes. And this, it's not a real Cinderella moon. He says my least favorite line in the entire goddamn franchise. This never happened to the other fella. I thought that was fucking great. I loved it. I loved it as well. I just think it's such a good, it's again, it's corny as fuck, but it's so funny. See, I despise that line because there's no context to it other than breaking the fourth wall. Like you literally, you cannot justify it as even a Cinderella thing of like, well, you know, well, this didn't happen to that guy. Cause there's nothing that points in that direction. And instead this is, continually cited for this theory that James Bond is a code name and each actor plays a different uh, person who just happens to be given the name James Bond, despite all the other evidence that says that it's the same character. He's married to the same people. He's had the same experiences, even in this movie and people go, yeah, but see, that means that that's a different guy. And each new actor is a new person that gets the code name of James Bond. And it's like, damn it. If they didn't have that line, people wouldn't have that basis as much. No, I absolutely I hate it. There's to me, it's one of those unquestionable. I would immediately erase that from the history of bond. If I could. No, I, I can understand that is one of the aspects that people would absolutely despise about it. And they're totally understandable in that side of things. I just, because I'm just watching this to just try and have fun, try and have fun. Yeah. I feel like it's a, it's a nice little casual nod to it about, it's like, throughout the entire movies constantly making references to the other guy and stuff like that it's just a one-off little thing and i think the like the fact they just references the fact that the girl like gets away gets away and stuff like that and he's left just holding his shoes to basically say well this never happens to the other guy the other guy the girl just like flew towards him and stuff like that and this girl's actively running away from me it's just like i, I yeah I, 
I, again, it's something that would annoy very hardcore Bond fans, but as I don't consider myself a hardcore Bond fan, I just found it hilarious. So. And, and I think that's exactly what it is in that, you know, Tony is a hardcore Bond fan and we, in a lot of ways, are just dipping our toes in. I just thought this was fun because, yeah, fucking get it out of the way. It's so clear <laughs> it's not the same guy. It just, hey, that never happened to the other one. Okay, now that we've addressed it, we don't have to say it again. And that's where I'm like, man, a rewrite, like you could, you could do, you could have your cake and eat it too. Like even a a line like, well, that's never happened before or something like, you know, or am am I off my game or like, uh, was it, was it something with my face? Like something like that, where it's like, okay, maybe there's more of a justification in the real world behind it. Instead of just like, LOL, I'm bond now. (laughs) Like, you know, I'm like, oh, damn it. (laughs) And to be fair, we live in a crazy world where people would have established these theories either way. Yeah, but then it would have been harder. And they go from that to to yet another thing where they're showing uh, the hourglass uh, motif and there's clips of the previous films to remind you that this is supposed to be the same guy. So they go, here's Q and Moneypenny and M. And he's got the um, thing from From Russia With Love. And he said he's James Bond. Oh, wait a minute. He might not be the same guy. Oh, wait. Here's a clip from the other movies to make your... It's like you just completely undermined yourself immediately. It's totally counterproductive. That gets under my skin so much. <laughs> I, I, th- I, think it, I think it's a difficult... Like, you're in a bit of a catch-22 here because it's just... You, you want to obviously establish this as like... This is a continuation of the series and stuff like that. But as far as I can tell... tell and obviously, I, I don't have like an infinite... Uh, history of the encyclopedic history of the cinema in my mind but i can't imagine there's been too many instances up to this point where like the main actor of a growing franchise at this point leaves and is replaced with someone else and they kind of have to figure out a way of maintaining that continuity of the entire series while also establishing that this is a new direction and a new approach for the character so i think the way they kind of try to weave in the past through the title sequence was a way to do it. It may not have been the optimal way to do it, but I feel like they don't, re- they didn't really have anything to guide them in that regards. Like, oh, previously when people have left series, like like major characters left series four, they've done this or whatever. They have to think on their feet and tried an approach to doing it. I don't feel like they should be criticised too much for for taking that approach. They're awful, and I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm more critical of just the overall like title sequence itself because I just think it's pretty like boring. Now I love the instrumental song on its own. It's a great track, one of my favorite pieces of score in the franchise. But as an opening theme, it's kind of terrible because it's got no lyrics. It, it's only memorable for hardcore Bond fans. You couldn't play this song and have any casual person know what it is. Me, did you like, want them to shoehorn on Her Majesty's Secret well, Service into a song? They, they've talked about that before, and they said they couldn't figure out any way to do it. And I don't blame them for it, because how do you write that? Yeah, tell us, Tony. You call it osmosis, so how are you going to fit it into a song? <laughs> on Her Majesty's Secret Service song. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> There's yeah, really... I, I The only way that you can really do it is if you do something that they didn't do until later on in the franchise, which was like, for Octopussy... You can't have a song called Octopussy, so they do All Time High, and they just go, fuck it, you know? I think it was just, it it marked a little bit of a, like, a departure, because you've had, like, three consecutive moves before that with, like, really good, powerful lyrics. And so this feels like a bit of a reset where you go back to the original two movies where there weren't no lyrics to the to the songs. So yeah. maybe part of that in the mind was like okay it's a little bit of a reset we'll just do one that's lyric based but not not not, not without lyric without lyrics entirely but i yeah but i just don't think that the theme itself is powerful enough on its own to really merit being the title sequence and then and the actions that surrounded it were just you know basic backgrounds and the silhouettes of the naked women and stuff like that it's just in just um like crouched down poses and stuff like that it's just like it wasn't it didn't feel like it was very action packed or dynamic. There's a, uh, also a little bit of trivia that the, the part where it says the director's name, uh, with the silhouette, there's a nipple showing. And in I'm blanking on the name of the country, which one it was might've been like Bolivia or something. They censored that 
and he's like, so uh, I don't get credit <laughs> in that series uh, for that you know, for doing that. It's just sort of all right. Now we cut to the other thing because we don't want to show a nipple, which is just you know you can see plenty worse in other films, including a nipple later on in this movie. This is the first time that there's pure unintentional nudity in a Bond film with a uh, Ruby. But yeah, uh, you know, if you say to me, like you want to have like a, a bond suite of like themes, I want this theme in there, but nobody's going to be like, Hey, name your favorite bond themes. And somebody would be like gold finger and like, you know, golden eye. And another person's going to go, bah, bah, bah. <laughs> like, you know, it's just, it doesn't play the same. Uh, any other thoughts on the music and opening titles? Yeah, one of my least favorites, though. So let's move on then to the casino. Bond's got a lavish hotel room. Casino's all colorful and whatnot. Purple's like running theme throughout this movie. You're showing off the fancy traveler aspect of the series, whatever. We got some Baccarat or Chemin de Fer. So typical, you know, sweevy, sweevy, banco, cart kind of stuff. <laughs> I just don't know what the fuck the <laughs> game is. Uh, people, somebody says Sweeby, somebody says Banco, and uh, Tracy leans over the table, and we get this cleavage angle, which is one of the most iconic shots of the film. She loses her hand, and she's like, "I don't have any money." <laughs> so, kind of a smooth move. Bond's like, uh, "Oh, you know, we forgot uh, that we were partners this evening," and he pays for her, and she just walks off because you know, I guess you know, fuck you. But she says a good line. Why do you persist in rescuing me, Mister Bond? you know maybe let's establish why he was saving her the first time uh nah screw it instead we're just gonna do more foreshadowing because she says uh people who stay alive play it safe and he says please stay alive at least for tonight well, well she said people who want to stay alive play it safe. that's <laughs> oh they felt the good justification for her you know going in the water but uh the please stay alive yeah uh, yeah that, that, that was a, I mean, that's a funny line. That's a Bond, that's a Bond tribe sort of line. You're just like, oh, okay, I just need you for yeah. this purpose. <laughs> I don't know what this note is. This is uh, out of context, but it's right next to that line. It says, horn noise, burp, 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 burp. I don't remember what I was doing calling back then because I wrote these notes a week ago. <laughs> yeah, uh, I can't, it can't might have been a reference to me messaging you a week ago, like, Huh, this is a great Bond girl. And then we would then go on to have conversations about how old she is today, or how did it, had, today. it has to be something with the music. <laughs> uh horn noise, burp burp, burp, burp. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Whatever it is. Totally, totally. Yeah, I don't know. Uh Bond gets to the hotel room, he's expecting Tracy, and there's a goon there to attack him again. He has got one of those lines. He says, uh, "Gate crasher, I'll leave you to tidy up." It's it's better. I, I there's worse. The hold on, hold on. Up, yeah. I liked that line, especially the gate crasher part because he threw him through the gate. I thought that was good. And this is a fighting scene that was directed by Kevin Dunn. And I at really point, no, no, obviously it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, what the fuck? It means like that all the camera cuts and stuff. Like, well, God, well, I didn't no. think it was the same Kevin Dunn. I thought that there was a Kevin Dunn. That did some kind of like second unit director or something like that. I was like, I didn't remember having about a Kevin Dunn that worked on there. I'm glad me and Callum are on the same wavelength. <laughs> the camera cuts here were just obnoxious. <laughs> what happened here? Got an experiment. Yeah. yeah, Bomb beat a guy up and uh, didn't get over because of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's a shame I mean, they didn't cut to uh, Roman's reaction. <laughs> I mean, the fight scene was what it was. It's what you expect from, like, the more animated fight scene. What I actually really loved about it was him just grabbing a piece of caviar and a piece of bread yep. on his way out and stuff like that. Right. Just, I like, like that, that better. So yeah, that's so Bond. Uh, Have you guys had caviar any, ever? No. I, yeah. I don't remember if I have or not. I think I might have tried it as part of, like, a sushi thing. But I don't know. If I yeah, did, right. I didn't remember liking it. Yeah, I so, definitely didn't hit you. Uh, and I've never had it after throwing somebody through uh, <laughs> you know, a bunch of furniture and everything. You don't say. No, that was a different time. Um, 
<laughs> I don't know where I'm going with that. Uh, he goes to his room. Tracy's there. She's wearing another revealing outfit, and uh, she's pointing the gun at him. He grabs it away, and he slaps her, and he says, I can be a lot more persuasive. I'm not a fan of how outright blunt that is for the character that we're supposed to believe in a few scenes he's madly in love with, and I'll come back to this a little bit later on. It's It's part of the time, but I hate it. I don't like the idea of being like, oh, I love you so much and smack, you know, it's just, it, I don't like it. <laughs> no, I'm not. No, obviously I'm not a fan of him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, some, some good old fashioned woman slapping is not exactly yeah. like my cup of tea. But again, you have to put it into the context of the time. But again, it's not something that you have to enjoy or appreciate and just learn from and just realize, yeah, this is a really different time where people really shitty towards women and so you have to you have to keep that comp- compartmentalized in your mind as you're watching it but I, what i did appreciate was like him doing all that stuff and then bond tells her to get dressed and i just literally wrote in my notes wow a bond that c- whose head can overpower his penis <laughs> I, I texted tony the same thing i said oh my god breaking news bond tells girl to get dressed yeah she wow. is the one that's actually like she considers herself like a bought woman for the night because he had, you know, re, uh, paid off her uh, her debt. She, she's going to repay her debt by sleeping with him. And there's another little bit of creepy dialogue where he's like, 40,000 francs is a lot of money. Like, you know, you're going to have to earn that one, kind of. And it's it comes off more creepy than charming for me. Um, I think that he doesn't... I, to me, it came across as just playful. And maybe that's just my context of its side of it. But I just feel like... He didn't mean anything over the top by it because she already said like she like she said like I always rep- repay my debts and she says it with enough like subtle innuendo attached to it that I feel like Bond was just playing it, leaning into it rather than him being just like outright say oh you always repay your debts let's fuck right now then <laughs> essentially that's like I I saw it as a bit more playful in my mind. I think a better yeah. actor would have pulled it off better. Maybe. I think this goes back to what Callum was saying about we get time with the characters in this movie and there's development rather than it's just like oh the things i do for england let's suck you know like <laughs> yeah. yeah well i appreciate the fact that because obviously had it, having no context going into the movie i didn't know that this woman was going to stick around for the entire movie so it could have just been a case of her just being the person that she, he bed straight away and she could find her dead the next scene or anything like that you never know but yeah. the fact that we do actually learn more about this character as it goes on it means that you kind of move past this first one night stand aspect of it and it is kind of a one night stand. She's gone the next morning. Her debt is basically paid off, but Bond gets a little bit of um, uh, repercussions out of that because these goons take Bond at gun and knife point into a car. Uh, Bond says the line, "We can make it a foursome," which I was like, eh. uh, <laughs> different context. And um, they take him to this warehouse where a custodian is whistling Goldfinger. Now. That I don't mind as far as like fourth wall breaking because it's just like a a sound. But I have a big note here on the commentary. Director Peter Hunt says, and I think this is what it kind of exhibits a lot of what my film uh, perspective of this is, of it being like half good and half utter shit. Uh, He's talking about how he tried to set up this motif about flowers always being around Tracy, like in the scene at the hotel, like there's flowers around and she's got this kind of flower near her. And at this part of the movie, she's got this flower and whatever. And of course, by the end of the movie, we see flowers on the car and everything. So it's like, Oh, you put a lot of thought into this. And then on the commentary of this scene, he reveals the whole janitor thing was him literally being like, I wanted a midget. Cause wouldn't it be great if there was a midget sweeping the floor? Like, uh, that's, yeah. <laughs> there's I mean, no we'll, reason we'll for it. In, in, in eccentricities. <laughs> that's the most. That's nah. going back to the wrestling thing. But that's the most Vince McMahon thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Not, like, yeah. Uh, he I doesn't mean, give I mean, any rationalization for it other than that. He's just like, I said the night before, we must have a midget. Wouldn't that be spectacular if we had a midget? <laughs> like, for what? <laughs> like, there's going to yeah. be a film later on in this franchise where there, there's there's a goddamn circus, and Bonds. Dressed up as a clown. And that's not the one that's like, let's get the the dwarf performer of the whatever, like to do this kind of thing, right? It's the one where it's just like, wouldn't it be funny if the custodian was a midget? <laughs> like, what? I don't understand yeah. that at all. 
maybe he thought it'd be like a talking point or something like that, or it'd make it more memorable if like oh, it's just just a random custodian. You should be an extra character if you make him a midget. Then maybe some people will remember him and just like. <laughs> I mean, like, it did stick out for me. I was like, oh, that's interesting. They've chosen to have a midget. It gives me vibes of um, John Peters from Kevin Smith's uh, tale of the Superman Lives movie, which if anybody hasn't seen it, check out Kevin Smith's. Uh, I forget the name of it. It's it's like a college tour that he did. And it's like Q and A's from the audience. And it is amazing. Because he goes on this whole diatribe about the Superman movie that he was writing and how the producers were all really weird about it. And the long and short of it is he had come in to look at some different projects. Like they were considering him to try to write Beetlejuice 2, Beetlejuice Goes Hawaiian. And he was like, I don't want to do that. What about the Superman movie? Can I take a crack at that? And one of the producers, John Peters, was like, uh, eventually he, after he got Kevin Smith to read him the script so he could lay down on his couch and imagine a, a, a screen projected on the ceiling, <laughs> he was like, I got three notes for you. Number one, I don't want to see him in that suit. He's not wearing a cape. That's two. And he used these words. This is me, not me using the words. He's like, it's too faggy. <laughs> Number two, uh, he can't fly. I don't want to see him flying. <laughs> just like it's Superman. And number three, he's got to fight a giant spider in the third act. <laughs> and it was this whole long thing about giant spiders. Oh my God, it's the, they're the fiercest animals in the animal kingdom and all this other kind of shit. So he unintentionally wrote Return of the King. Well, he was the guy who uh, worked on Wild Wild West. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it just strikes me as that kind of thing where it's like, the night before they're filming this scene, director Peter Hunt's just like, I didn't imagine it. <laughs> He's just kind of like, what? <laughs> anyway. I, I kind of appreciate Wild Wild West as it's always proven to me that uh, Will Smith isn't perfect. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Neither is Selma Hayek, but yeah, you know. Um, so closer, closer than Will Smith. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look at her. Uh, so yeah. Bond fights off the goons. He grabs a knife and he's ready to throw it at Draco. The guy who owns the place. Now, I do like this little bit quite a bit. This is one of my favorite parts of the whole film, where he throws a knife at the calendar, and Draco puts on his glasses, and the shot refocuses so you can see it clearly, like as if he put his glasses on, and that's how he can read where he had hit, which I love. And then he goes, oh, but today's the 13th, because Bond hit the 14th, and Bond just goes, I'm superstitious. <laughs> that's, now, yeah, that's a really good line. There's two ways to interpret that. Did he mean to miss it? And he's just doing this to make himself laugh, which is great. Or did he miss it? And he's covering it up with this ready remark, which is great. <laughs> Both ways. I love it. Absolutely love it. Very good. Very, to me, one of his better quips. And like I said, it was stuff like this that made me sad that he didn't get more time with the character. This is a very Connery kind of moment, I think. He would have been, you know, uh, complaining about the, well, you know, you don't use uh, uh, this kind of a drink in this time frame or whatever, and like that kind of stuff. I like when he gets kind of like snooty about something. And of course, uh, he, he reverses his own cigarettes and everything too, because yeah, it's fucking Bond. Okay, we need to talk about this conversation with Draco. It's very, very <laughs> oh, I've got a, a, I've got a paragraph of this. <laughs> Okay, so, so Bond knows all about Draco, Draco, and he gives a rundown of his criminal organizations and his legitimate businesses and whatever, and Draco says, I'm also Tracy's father. Now, apparently, the actor is only 13 years older than Diana Rigg. We're, we're going to do a deeper dive into Tracy, by the way. We, I don't think anybody to think that we're not um, skipping past her, because she's obviously one of the most iconic, best, biggest parts of this film. But Draco says, I know everything you've done with her. Good work, pal, basically. <laughs> and Bond, we're going to get into some specific lines, but Bond is like, she needs a psychiatrist, not me. A very astute kind of observation. And Draco says a line which I fucking hate. <laughs> yeah, I, I know what it, I know what it is. And yeah, again, it's something that just is 
again <laughs> on the context of the time, but even in the context of time, it's a little bit like oh. right. He says <laughs> what she needs is a man to dominate her, <laughs> to make love to her enough to make her love him. A man like you. Okay. Okay. Oh wanna, my god. <laughs> okay, that line is terrible. That or it's it's. Uh, yeah, uh, it's not a, it's not a terrible line in the sense that okay i'm just trying to put it in some sort of context trying to almost yeah. justify it even though it shouldn't i shouldn't be justifying it because it's the right for, for putting it in there in the first place but this guy is or well, essentially from the sense of when we set he's obviously about 50 60 years old at this point yeah and so he's from the very very early 20th century where he was born and raised and that sort of things where it was even worse <laughs> in that regards to mm. in terms of attitudes towards women so i can kind of understand that mentality of the character for saying things like that it doesn't make the line any less cringeworthy because it is but you can understand what that guy's going from and to his credit bond does not agree with him right that i'm a, that, a fan of yeah so even though this guy's saying this thing and and then we find and then throughout the rest of the movie he's like an ally to bond is a little bit you know <laughs> on the nose like you can't really super like this guy because of that sort of attitude that he has towards all this but again again it's like he's a product of his time it just feels like fan fiction or something to me like somebody who's really into the misogyny aspect like wrote that line you know yeah the line itself is extremely disturbing in that context in today's context in any context but at the same time, from what we've seen in, in movies past, true, it's almost surprising that he wasn't like absolutely and I'm the man for the job, pal. Like, <laughs> you know. he's like, "Do you hear what this said?" The pussy galore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, yeah, again, it's not, it's not good, but it's just you can understand it in the context. I think it says a lot that by 1969, Bond was like, "No, no, that's that's not okay. We should get her some help." He's like, I'll slap her around a little bit, but it's like... <laughs> I mean, we're making progress here. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's 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 interesting because again, we haven't done a deep dive into Tracy yet, but just the whole context of as an overall character, I think Tracy is like obviously very strong, very uh, determined, very like capable on her own to of doing as much that she needs to do. And then, but Draco's perspective of that is that she's crazy and she's reckless and she's out of control rather than being independent and strong and a, like an actual like confident self-assured woman and that's just the amazing dichotomy of like things in the past like how people would perceive women who had self-assurance and confidence and could get by without a man constantly that's being something crazy and bewildering and burn them at the stake they're a witch type mentality yeah. rather than like nowadays it's something that should be heralded and like like held up there it's like the 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 whole um context of the quote-unquote strong female character that's basically based around that sort of mentality whereas people in the past were just like well strong female characters well they must be crazy or insane because if you're not if you're not essentially a side piece to a man's story mm -hmm. then you're doing something wrong as a woman so, yeah like you know your job is to get yourself a husband and you know yeah, exactly. like that kind of thing and that's Drake's so mentality I don't know when this film was released, and obviously, like, it's, you know, Britain and not America, but the bra burning and the Miss America thing happened a year prior to this movie coming out. It makes sense. Like, this is a very good Bond girl for the year, and it almost makes sense that there would be somebody in her life that would have that perspective, but it doesn't make sense that he's not and now and now villain yeah because like she's rebelling against this idea which is good because she should but i mean like he he offers <laughs> he offers bond a million pounds to marry her and bond's like i'm a bachelor and he's basically like come on fuck her a couple more times if you like it you know like that kind of thing and i like that bond is more interested in using draco for his resources to find blofeld he's not like Okay, well, you know how I'm, I'm going to hang out, and I guess I'll do this on the side. He's sort of like, all right, maybe I can placate this guy a little bit because I think that he might be able to get me to get Blofeld. I like that element of this, but I don't love the idea that essentially Bond's biggest love interest ends up being somebody that I don't think he spends a lot of time with in the movie. 
because other women in the series are around for longer chunks of the film. And ultimately she goes from a character that seems like she could be very much like even more stand on her own to falling in love with him out of nowhere because like she's horribly depressed and dealing with emotional issues and she gets attached right out of the gate just because he might be interested in her a little bit. And uh, oh, he only slapped me once like that kind of thing. And it's like, it's kind of, it comes off more overall skeevy to me than romantic. And I think that that sucks because Diana Rigg is a great actress. I think that she is obviously beautiful. I like her better when her hair is down for personal taste than the, the hair in the bun type of thing. And she has it in her to play this badass, amazing woman with this agency to her. And I don't think the script does her justice. And a scene like this more so sets up, I want her to have her moments and I don't feel like she gets them as much. Like I love the Tracy character. And then you have to have parentheses or not parentheses, uh, apostrophe S potential. Her character's potential is so much better than her character, I think. I would I would definitely agree with that perspective. But in terms of like trying to again put it into some sort of element of context, that would be like going from zero to sixty. Yeah, true. By having essentially the the previous movies where the Bond girls are even depending on whatever sort of like screen time they get, they're just essentially bit part characters that eye candy. Apart from like a couple of notable examples, mainly uh, Domino and um, uh, the Femme Fatale from that movie, the name escapes me. Uh, Fiona. Fiona. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they're kind of like the exceptions, not the rule. Whereas this one takes a bit of a departure by making Tracy more of a focal point. And I agree with you. They, I think if this movie was remade, mm -hmm. they would have a lot more character development of Tracy and there'd be a lot more of her on her own and her doing her own thing. But at the end of the day, this movie is a Bond movie. Bond's on the poster. Bond's the character that everyone came to see at this point in time. So it focuses more on his story and the Tracy stuff happens in the background. And you have that montage to uh, like later on to. Um, oh, we're uh, going to get into that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas like, I assume that's what they, they essentially try and go the whole Tracy falling in love with Bond rather than like him, uh, her seeing him as like a rescuer or someone who isn't actually interested in him, it's only interested in information that her father can give him and that's the only reason that he's pursuing her and that's when they actually like establish a relationship but they do it in the span of a two minute montage rather than build it up over the course of the movie, which is the wrong way to do it but at least it's it's a step in the right direction for this franchise Yeah and I don't want to reiterate too much of what Callum said, I I had told you privately that I thought Tracy, first of all, was absolutely stunning. And then when you get into the actual character development, it makes you almost upset that they hadn't done this up until this point. Yeah. Because how much more could we have established with other characters in the past had they just allowed them to flourish? Like, uh, the name is escaping me right now, but the sister from Domino, Go no, from Goldfinger. No, oh, Tilly Masterson. Yeah, like imagine fleshing out that character the way mm -hmm. they did here. I think this is the beginning of, you know, the Bond movies kind of getting on track with character development. I hope I didn't just spoil anything for myself in the future. Well. <laughs> The next one turns into a bimbo by the end of the film. So, oh, so <laughs> yeah, she got a good name though, Tiffany Case. <laughs> um, so anyway, we go to MI6. Bond throws his hat. Another reminder, he's the same character. Money Penny has the line, "Same old James." It's very on the nose. And uh, M says he's taking Bond off the Blofeld operation because he's had two years. So fuck you. Even though you are our best guy, that's not good enough. And Bond uh, is pissed. So he gets Money Penny to take a memo about his resignation and starts cleaning out his desk. And there's one thing after another reminding you he's the same Bond as before. It's to an almost ridiculous level. There, he got underneath the mango tree playing, and he's for some reason looking at Honey Rider's knife and belt. I don't know why he would have that, but okay. Yeah, Tim is a mento. Uh, he's looking at the watch from From Much With Love, the rebreather from Thunderball, which easily makes the most appearances out of any Bond uh, gadget in this franchise, other than the fact that, you know, a watch, a car, that kind of thing. 
But M calls Bond back, and you think he's going to say, oh, no, no, Bond, please don't leave. I got this message about that. And he goes, request granted. And Bond's like, uh, fuck, he called my bluff. <laughs> Asshole, like, you know. But it turns out, which I love, Money Penny didn't send the resignation. She sent a request for a two-week temporary leave of absence, and both Bond and M are relieved, which is cute, because Bond's like, uh, oh, Money Penny, what would I do without you? And Money Penny, uh, you know, he he leaves, and Money Penny's intercom goes off, and M's like, what would I do without you? <laughs> like, you kept Bond, and Bond's like, you kept my job. Like, I love that. Yeah. This was my favorite Money Penny interaction so far. Yeah, Money Penny was great in this type of thing. It's just I love the the uh, stage earlier on where Bond's like flirting with her as usual, and Bond calls her Britain's last line of defense. Yeah, it's like the <laughs> the only like thing that hasn't been penetrated by Bond before is like this affair. <laughs> and uh, the the bit where he's like talking, he's going through like all the little fixtures from the previous movie, and he looks up at the um image, the um fo- on the, fo- the the painting of Queen Elizabeth, and just says, "Sorry, ma'am." That's yeah. hilarious. I just love that part. <laughs> And uh, and then the money penny thing at the end. This is the only time that Bond kisses Money Penny, I believe, at least in like the earlier franchise parts of it. Yeah, there's plenty of other times uh, here and there, but yeah. I think maybe at the other uh, Connery might have kissed her on the cheek, maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I just thought it was just interesting. Just like he just kissed her on the lips. I thought, oh, that's a bit, <laughs> that's a bit like going a bit far in this relationship now. It is a little bit weird. Penny. The age yeah. difference starts to show. Yeah, it, get, it gets caught back up, of course, eventually with well, yeah, more. Well, yeah, to, to be fair, it's just like, uh, well, it's, it's interesting because more treats, um, as far as I can uh, recall from bits that I've like, read and stuff like that, more treats Money Penny more as like a mother figure or a bit more of like that sort of thing rather than the fact that more is ridiculously old and can actually like pass from being in a relationship with Money Penny instead. I get the but, feeling with more, and we'll talk about it, of course, when we get into his things. Uh, like Lazenby, so Connery and Money Penny, that character side of things is more like they're, uh, it's like the normal Money Penny relationship that we get with Brosnan. And with Lazenby, I get this kind of like he's flirting with the older girl because she's like, ooh, like the, uh, you know, the young guy, the strapping 29 year old is flirting with me kind of like, I don't know, uh, you flirting with uh, somebody's aunt or something. And with more, I get more like a uh, friendly feeling like they're on par with each other. They used to be friends kind of a thing. And then you recast the character and, you know, things get different. Uh, when we get to Dalton, it's pretty much money. Penny's just like, Oh my God, I want him. And Dalton's just like, give me that fucking gadget. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? But like, <laughs> But I love this interaction. I think, again, this is the type of thing that it's like, man, it's a shame that they couldn't have filmed on Her Majesty's Secret Service before You Only Live Twice. And this these things could have happened. Because imagine feeling like, oh, my God, Connery is leaving the Bond franchise. He's quitting. He's resigning. Like, And it's the same guy holding up the props from the things. I think that that could have worked so much better. Obviously, it didn't. Cause it didn't happen. But a lot of this movie, I wish, could have been Connery. Or at least just the same guy from before, in theory. But anyway, we get to Draco's birthday party, which is a bullfight thing. It's kind of strange, but whatever. Uh, I don't know what people do for their... Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Happy birthday, Papa, uh, is what I wrote down. There's somebody that I want uh, you to meet. Hey, look, it's that guy you fucked. I want you to fuck him some more. (laughs) I like that um, there's a little bit of a, a dialogue. Uh, Mr. Bond and I have already met. Uh, he says uh, she always makes one feel so welcome. And Drake goes like, she likes you. I can see it. And he goes, uh, you must be give me the name of your Oculus. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Tracy, credit where it's due. She realizes that she's kind of being auctioned off a little bit, or at least used for some kind of like a pawn. And she calls him out on their bullshit. She's smart. She assumes Bond is only pretending to be interested in her to get the information. So she says to her dad, just tell Bond what he wants to know. Cut to the chase. Skip to the inevitable part where he leaves. And I don't have to get my hopes up. And at this point, 
I mean, what is there to be enamored with this guy? He randomly saved you out of nowhere from, I guess, you were trying to kill yourself. But again, we don't have any information. And he slapped you. You fucked him. It's not like a quite hooker relationship, but it's a little bit weird. Uh, I mean, I'm getting married later on this year. I don't have the same kind of relationship <laughs> with no, uh, Caroline. But No, no I, I do get that side of it. But it's just a case of the early relationship with Bond and this woman, Tracy, is obviously it's part of the course of Bond in terms of his... Yeah, uh, encounters with women, but then once he, he, she she's done this thing where essentially she calls out the fact that the father's he just using her for information, and then he gives her the information, but then he goes back to see how she is and stuff like that. Yeah. That for me is the transition point. And again, it should be explored more. And if this was done in modern times, it's a movie been made in modern times, it would have been explored more explicitly, I think. But for this case, you only are going to get that two minute montage. Yeah. <laughs> At least in that in that small snippet, you see Bond has has an affinity with this woman which exceeds any affinity that he's had with a woman beforehand. Yeah, he does actually go walk. Uh, she walks off, and he goes to see her, and he's like, "No, I actually like am interested in getting to know you," and wipes away her tears. And it's like, oh, "Okay, Bond's not a complete asshole." But we get a, a montage. It's not a Rocky montage. <laughs> it's like, no, uh, you know, uh, push it to the limit. Instead, we've got, we have all the time in the world. <laughs> uh, they just basically say, we're going to skip the developing a relationship drivel and tell you uh, in these week uh, or two weeks or whatever, they fall in love because they walk around and smile. <laughs> that, yeah, no, again, it, again, it's not perfect, but at the end of the day, people aren't watching Bond movies to be like super into the romance yeah. side of it. But but yeah, it should be done better, but it's it's better than anything they've done before, so I give it a thumbs up for that point. What do you guys think of the song? This is a real Bond theme of this, for all intents and purposes, and it doesn't feel like a Bond theme to me, but it's a good song. Yeah. Again, it's it's it fits the theme of the movie of it being more romance-based to have that sort of song in it, but I think mean, Louis Armstrong's great. You can't really be too upset about having that song in the movie. Yeah, I thought the song was pretty good. Is used well and yeah, thumbs up for me. Gen- I mean, genuinely, obviously, the song itself is just like the reason why it's so great is because the last line in the movie, which we'll obviously get to at some point, but like that, that, that makes the whole song, whether you like to or dislike to, it makes it all worthwhile. It's not my least favorite song in the franchise. It's it's on the lower end, it, just for like for Bond themes or whatever. I like the song. Like anybody's gonna go, why do you hate? This? No, I I like the song. And it's definitely not even my least favorite song in this film. We'll get to that one later. Uh, (laughs) But it is kind of a departure. It is strange. And it wouldn't have worked for the opening credits either. I know some people have been like, why don't you move that up? That would have been really weird. Um, But, you know, we get the montage out of the way. Uh, He's taking these two weeks off. I'm willing to suspend a little bit of disbelief. I mean, this is the franchise where he basically fucks pussy galore into not being a villainous lesbian. So, you know, uh, kind of ridiculous that that quickly they can fall in love. But then again, that happens. There's people that Have fall in love with somebody immediately. Movie? Right. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> I'll, like I'll give them a pass. And there's this funny little shot um, where they're in the car and Draco sitting between them and they are giving each other googly eyes. Like there's some teenagers and he's got this like perturbed face, which flies directly in opposition to the guy who earlier was like, please fuck my daughter. Like, you know, <laughs> But it's you know it is what it is, and oh, I have a note that that's written down. Enough of that love crap. Let's get back into Bond stuff, so Tracy can fuck off entirely for the next half of the film. Because <laughs> it's pretty true. I'm sorry. Did you say you were getting married when? <laughs> that's how it seems like they're doing. No, no there there is that element. That's not my again. perspective. I wanted more of the love story. <laughs> no, again, I wanted more of Tracy as well. I yeah. wanted more of Tracy involvement in that side of it as well. But again, you have to build into the idea that this is a Bond movie. People are here to see Bond. Tracy is, even though she is like a big part of the movie, she has her part of the movie, as it were. Whereas this part is the Bond focus thing. This is, again, the, that's why I have it labeled that, because this is how I feel like they were approaching this movie, which was, oh, yeah, all right, we got the love stuff out of the way. We did the montage or whatever. Let's get that crap out of the way and let's have Bond do Bond. And I feel like this movie is like six scenes, essentially, 
and they were like, here's the love thing. Let's do the bond thing. Then we'll do the action. And then we do the end kind of like, that's obviously not six, but you know what I mean? Like, it's like very jarring what they transition from. Cause these past couple of scenes, it's been entirely about the romance. And then they just halt and go completely into, well, now we, let's get into Blofeld. And she is gone for at least half of the film. Well, hmm. I mean, yeah, there is that there is that point to it. But again, Bond is a, in a completely different setting throughout this entire part of it as well. So there is a sense that, well, what really could we be learning? F- I mean, again, again, if it was again morally made, you would be finding out more about Tracy outside of this so- side mm-hmm. of it. But and she'd be more of an independent character, not just linked to Bond as much. But you do get the sense of, well, Tracy's not being involved in the Bond side of things at the moment. She's not really being involved in like the investigation. She doesn't know who Blofeld is or anything along those lines, really. So, so once Bond has got his lead on Blofeld, and that is essentially what his mission is. That's what he's there to do: is to find Blofeld and deal with all that stuff. The tra- he's ha- ha- had the relationship with Tracy. Once he deals with Blofeld, the at least the sense I get is that he's going to go back to Tracy after that. But he has to deal with Blofeld first. I think a better movie with a rewrite incorporates Tracy into the investigation and they can develop that love story more throughout the film instead of just later on when we get to a, a a nice uh, rank that it's just like, Oh, there she is. You know, but we get Gumbold's office. I have a note that says that dude totally looks like a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's all the note says. I'm assuming it's Gumbold. Uh, I really like the music in this scene. Dum 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 da 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 dum 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 da da dum. It's a neat little bit of spy work. You got the Draco's construction guys. Uh, the guy's never named in the movie, but apparently his name is Sean. Uh, he helps Bond transfer this case over that's got the safe cracking equipment with this copier, which is very like so, you know, different time, you know. So it's amazing how technology regresses almost because he had a safe cracking device previously that fitted in his pocket yep <laughs> and they have one that has to be like lifted by a crane into the building but this is because it's a it's a safe cracker slash printer scanner thing it's like it's like it's, it's dual purpose for those really weird situations where you need a safe cracker and a printer at the same time uh it's admittedly it's a little bit of a boring scene as we literally watch bond flip through a playboy that he found in the newspaper which is kind of funny that it's hidden in there <laughs> The machine does all the work for him, and he's just sitting there. I I would have rather have had him crack the safe. You know, I like the music. I also like that Bond steals the Playboy. <laughs> well, I think they had to do the thing of like the extension of time because the gu- Gunbolt said that he was going to be back in an hour, and so he had to basically just kill an hour of Bond just sitting there waiting for the safe to crack itself. Yeah, nobody goes into his office, which is good too. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Just a whole hour, just like it's locked in there. But I like the fact that Bond, because um, he pockets the guy's key, and you never see you, it's again. It's just like a bit of sleight of hand. And you have that scene outside where Gumball is like checking his pockets, and you assume that he's going to find his key and go straight back up there. But he just he finds like a wallet or something like that, and then he just realizes, okay, I'll just keep going then. It's like we don't really see much of Bond's sleight of hand until this point. Yeah, pretty much in the previous films, when he's tried to do a sleight of hand, he's gotten caught. Like, uh, he tried to get the Beretta back, and M's like, yeah, leave the Beretta, you know? I thought, like, the machine cracking the safe instead of Bond, I don't mind that, because we're trying to push towards this, oh, we're headed towards the future, and, you know, it's around the same time of, look at this wacky, massive graph computer that does things, because <laughs> machines are the way of the future. If only they had I gotten don't... Adam West. <laughs> I thought that was good, and I like that Bond steals the Playboy because that's very Bond. And that's more unintentional nudity because he folds it up not quite in time and shows the camera, which is funny. Uh, Bond goes to M's house, of all things, and M's got all these butterflies and moths and whatever on the wall, and Bond is a total smug dickhead. I love it. He's like, oh, unusually small for a nymphalis polychlorus. And M's like, I wasn't assured that your expertise included lepidoptery. <laughs> Like, God damn it, you even like the shit that I like or whatever. It's... But, oh, man, after that, I got a note that says in all caps, snooze alert. Blofeld is looking into ancestry. 
and it's like, let's meet with Sir Hilary Bray, and we can talk about your family crest of arms, which is <laughs> Orbis non sufficit, or suffice it. I don't know. Uh, the world is not enough is what it translates to. Brilliant. Of course, comes back deliciously in a future Bond film. Can you guess which one? <laughs> Uh, tomorrow never dies. Yeah, bingo. Yeah. <laughs> that and octopusy. <laughs> but yeah, I love I love that little thing. Oh, that's what Bond's family crest is. The world's not enough. <laughs> but uh, we talked about this earlier. The man who does Sir Hilary Bray, uh, the actor who's um, playing the part, uh, he does the voice dubbing for Bond when he's impersonating him. Uh, on the topic of voice dubbing, uh, Draco's lover. You want to guess who uh, voices her? Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna remember her name. When it is. Nikki like Vanderzil. <laughs> uh, but George Baker, the guy who played uh, Bray, he supposedly uh, was the guy that Ian Fleming wanted to play James Bond before Connery had been cast. Mm. So and that didn't happen, obviously. But since he dubs Bond later on in the film, he does technically get to play Bond. Oh, good for him. You know, a little bit. Interesting. I think by this point, uh, like Fleming had probably be signing the entire franchise. So. Oh, at this point, Fleming's dead. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, the first one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He dies before. That was, uh... that was a relief. They probably just did that to spite him. It's just like, okay, we'll cast <laughs> this guy now. That he, now that you're dead, we'll cast this guy. And he gets the bit you Bond's voice from about like two thirds of the movie. Away. <laughs> yeah, uh, George didn't even um, get a chance to test for the role when Ian Fleming's like, this is the guy that could play a really good James Bond. The producers were like, nope. And just <laughs> moved on and went to somebody else. But they brought him back and they did this. So that's kind of cool. Uh, Bond. <laughs> I don't know why I have this uh, structured in my notes. It's this way. This seems like it should be uh, a, a serialized thing. Bond goes to the allergy fact uh, facility. <laughs> like, that should have been the foreign title. Mm. Bond meets Irma Bunt. A lesser version of Rosa Klebb, I think. A little bit. I think that she was... She's a bit more amenable as a character. She's not as pure evil from her like just outward persona. So. Yeah, she's more like a like a pain in the ass boss. Yeah. Or, uh, the so the horrible of warden is. of the thing. Like she, I like her. Uh, by me saying a Rosa, a lesser Rosa Club, I like Rosa Club a lot more. But I like Irma Bunt. Yeah, yeah, she was. Yeah, I think she was perfectly fine in the role. Yeah, I agree with what you said. And that she's a lesser Rosa Club, but it is what it is. Can I just add here as well, because I know you obviously you talked about the snooze fest. I really enjoyed the exposition of the the him trying to claim the count title and stuff like that. I think it was a nice little an early sign of just like how Blowfield is trying to conceal his um like his major motive or his major purposes of this movie. To me, that's just one of those things that if you start to explain the, the movie to somebody, people would be like, why are you watching this? They'd be like, oh, you know, Bond's going after this guy and he's trying to become a count and we're going to get into ancestry and, oh, he's going to talk to M about moths and whatever. And people would be like, what movie is this? You know, that's okay. It we got a montage be- in there. <laughs> you know? It can't always be spontaneous sex and exploding cars, Tony. Uh, well, maybe they should have spontaneous explosions. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, car, car sex? Sick. I don't know. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I was like, fifty-fifty there. But we get our first taste of a terribly ear grating song. Do you know where Christmas trees are grown? Uh, that opens up another question. Is this a Christmas movie? It is really. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if Die Hard's a Christmas movie, this is a Christmas movie. I'll just say. Well, yeah, that. they said it took place around Christmas. I subscribe to the Die Hard theory, so yeah. <laughs> Hate this song, and it pops up like three times. Hate it I with a passion. I don't know what you're talking about in that regard, so I can't. So I, uh, clearly, it didn't leave much of a, a resonance on me. Bingo! I'm with Cal. <laughs> it plays like uh, in the scene um, with a crowd. It's playing like throughout that whole scene and everything too. It's just this like kids singing, kind of like, kind of like, meh, 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 kind of like. No, uh, that's a bad impression. I can't pretend to be a, a kids choir. Yeah, I think I've uh, noted that if you was like that. In the- <laughs> It's just not a good song. I hate it. Uh, let's see what Bond pretends to be sick and meek and all the helicopter, uh, helicopter ride uh, over the mountaintop. Great you know, visuals and everything. Um, there's this allergy research facility, which was a former sports facility. Everybody in the town is wearing these Olympic jackets, which is this weird detail. And the uh, the thing itself 
uh, was this restaurant that they were trying to build. And to be able to film there, they basically had to build the restaurant for them. So that's why it, it revolves. Because <laughs> wow. they wanted a revolving restaurant. <laughs> Ah. I'm getting some uh, extra like building work done enough due to making this movie. Yeah, they had to like actually build the helipad and actually build a restaurant and everything and just make it a set because they were just like, oh, it's on a mountaintop. It's great. Um, everyone is staying in a spot where they can't open up their doors to their rooms. It's not at all threatening or suspicious, right? <laughs> That's all uh, part of the process. Explained it. But Bond for, checks. For your safety, really. Yeah, uh, Bond checks out his room for bugs, and oddly, they use "We have all the time in the world" here as this happy little jingle, which throws me off. I'm not saying that he should have had the you know -da 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 kind of thing in the middle of that, but uh, it's just a odd tonal shift throughout this movie here and there. Like 75 percent of it seems silly, and then they get super serious. I don't like how jarring that is. I, I like the fact that he's. Um, I just like the fact that it's it's continuing the trope of Bond. When he enters a hotel room or temporary prison, you always have to check everything out. Yeah, my only criticism about it is the music for that. Yeah. I, I clearly like, and I guess, I guess me and Rob are basically in the same boat. I really don't pay much attention to the music that's going on in the background of these things. I mean, if it's really, like, if it's good and it hits, like those sirens, like, yeah, I mean, out. you guys are going to be hearing sirens in this one. Hopefully, you're not paying too much attention to that. <laughs> You know, like the, that stands out. I mean, if it's just background and it fits and it's not really anything jarring, then I don't really notice it. You can make an argument that maybe he's thinking about Tracy, but I don't think that they come that across. I think that that's people making arguments for supporting a movie that is just sort of like, oh, let's just do that. It's floaty oh. and whatever. I'll tell you one thing, in a couple of minutes, you might be thinking about Tracy at all. <laughs> Not at all, because the Allergy Research Center, for some reason, has, well, they, we figure out later on what the reason was, all these beautiful women from all across the world, and they are all suffering some some sort of allergy, and they're all apparently super dick hungry, because <laughs> every one of them wants to jump his bones immediately, especially Ruby Bartlett, who is... As horny as if all that ice on the mountainside melted, if you catch my drift. <laughs> um. I, mean, I mean, okay, let's try, try and break it down a little bit in the sense that they talk about the fact that they've been, we don't know how long they've been there for. It probably is months at a time, and it's only been yeah. women there. And so maybe a, a few of them, if not all of them, are like kind of, well, yeah, interested in having some male companionship. And they kind of show it here. And let's, let's put it this way. Uh, George Lazenby is not in any way unattractive. Right. So he's like, okay, you see that opportunity. Like, you're going to try and shoot your shot a little bit. And he and he has to try and play this guy as, like, Hillary's like a guy that's not really interested in women. Yeah, I don't he's know kind of trying to intimate that he's gay. Well, they, they definitely are. He's kind of playing like a foppish sort of gay thing. And they flat out say, of course, I know what he's allergic to. And then Ruby later on says, you're funny pretending not to like girls. And he goes, oh, I, well, I don't usually. So they're full on trying to play into that. Meanwhile, Ruby. Because we, we've established that as long as you have sex with the right person of the opposite sex, it'll yeah. early change your perspective on things. Well, I mean, if Bond's magical penis cures people of being gay, uh, according to Draco, he just needs a real man to fuck him. <laughs> and... <laughs> And dominate him. And uh, <laughs> she's uh, biting that chicken leg like she's, uh, yeah, you know. Yeah, what the fuck was that? <laughs> like, that specifically was just so weird. Like, that seems like something out of Family Guy. Like, oh, look what I can do with this chicken leg. Right. <laughs> uh, here's something that's interesting to think about. They're all eating what uh, you're, I guess supposed to be legitimately allergic to yeah and they're not breaking out in hives and stuff which means that blofeld legitimately found a way to cure allergies which is insane including you know hillary there yeah he said he's also explained it later on it's a mixture of psych, uh like essentially psychology or hypnotherapy and um and vaccines so i guess there are vaccines in there that like like antihistamines and stuff like that that help like subside the effects of it and maybe a lot of 
again, I, at this point in time, I don't know how much research has been done on allergies and stuff like that and the causes behind them. And so maybe some people would believe that a lot of it was psycho, psychological rather than actually like physical. Meanwhile, you can wash off the radiation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. yeah, so they're not, they're not really paying too much attention on that side of things and being super accurate. I mean, the thing that I love so much about Ruby as like just a character is that she just is a is a girl. And that's just like, this sounds like the weirdest thing to say, that sort of thing. But that, that Lancashire accent. Oh, God. <laughs> I know you're going to hate it because you, you think to dislike anybody that has a strong, strong British accent of any type. Really. It's a strong accent of any type. Doesn't have to be a British one. Strong accent, period. She is yeah. very, like, uh, you know, uh, went to the country, like, kind of thing. And it's just like, yeah. She's so, that was, makes her so real. Yeah. It's like, she's, she's not putting on, like, this fake, like, glorified movie actress voice mm-hmm. that everyone has to pertain and stuff like that she has like a real genuine accent that i could hear on the radio every now and now again today and stuff like that it's just that makes me feel like she's a real person oh i i i hate her accent and i love her character because she is just this like bimbo type like i mean uh like again with the chicken like that's a, a matter of her being like look at me eat this chicken leg and it's just like of course like this type of character is just sort and while, of yeah and while they're doing all the eating and stuff like that bond is explaining the entire history of heraldry yeah <laughs> they're <laughs> bored out of their minds falling no, asleep I, I, know, I know but i i do like that aspect of it because it shows that bond has really like delved into this character he's like just like taking on this role obviously again it's like actually being people. a spy yeah he's actually doing the spy mm-hmm. work rather than just putting a like little plastic things over his eye, eyebrows and just stuff like that. It's just like he's actually doing his job behind that side of it. And he talks about how his uh, coat of arms has four bezants on it or gold balls, as they were. Yeah. And then there's a little callback to that later on where like Ruby sees him like, and <laughs> just says, like, Oh, it's true. It's just it's like, true. It's just, like his, is he painting his balls gold? <laughs> gold number. Oh, uh, there you go. <laughs> I do really like the thing where she uh, she writes on his inner thigh with lipstick her room number, and Irma Bunt's like, "Are you okay?" And he goes, "Just a slight stiffness coming on." <laughs> so good. That, that's just like these sort of like these minds are just really well put together. They're just they're just the right level of corny for me. Apparently, when they were filming that scene, they warmed up a sausage and put it between his pants. <laughs> And she just didn't react. She was just like, that's his thing. And they were like, nah, we got you. A good little thing. Um, well, now what kind of sausage? Oh, I don't know. They didn't dive too much deep into that. Yeah. I mean, that's that's low-level hazing in the grand scheme of things. Really. Right. <laughs> I just thought that was a funny little prank to pull. Um, I, mean, we, I mean, we hear stories about certain directors that would go, like, actually, you have to see the sausage and do stuff with the sausage. If yeah. you're actually right, the yeah. Like that's the, so in the effort, oh, that's a little playful thing. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's, it didn't seem like there was any ill will about that. It was them just being like, oh, haha, that's funny, you know. Yeah. But here's a big, 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 big criticism. Bond meets Blofeld, who is pretending to st- uh, still be uh, Blochamp. And massive continuity errors. They've met in person. Why are you acting like you don't know each other? Well, at the very least, you would think it'd be like, ah, oh, fuck, there's Bond. Guards, kill him. And Bond would be like, hey, fixed your eye. Mm. Instead, yeah, they yeah. try to play off this thing that he's got no earlobes, which is weird and stupid. Yeah, yeah I think, yeah, it is It is obviously an odd side of it because you talk about the earlobes thing is that that's supposed to be like a character trait, a genetic trait of um, the de Blochamp family is that they don't have earlobes. And so it's trying to describe that side of it and that's how he's trying to justify that he's part of that family even though he clearly isn't. Um, and yeah, they probably should recognise each other. That's the issue. Maybe they're trying to just fob it off with the idea that because Bond is dressed as Hillary instead that maybe that's enough of a, de- of a departure for Blofeld not to recognise him, but it, it's it's way too much of a stretch. But then again, they're two completely different actors playing the two <laughs> two different characters, so maybe that's maybe that's the nod to it instead. Yeah, I hate it. <laughs> I think that that's uh, again, it was it was supposed to be filmed before you only live twice. The book was written to take place before you only live twice, mm. and. In the book, I didn't read them, but in the book, You Only Live Twice is where Bond is going after Blofeld to kill him. So it's like, it makes more sense. Whereas in this one, it's just like, well, 
I'm not going to pretend that I know who you are. I'm not going to pretend I know who you are, whatever. Let's talk about some documents and certification and other riveting things. <laughs> but Bond escapes his room. He shorts out the electrical wiring of the door so you can go fuck Ruby. And, I don't think uh, that's all MacGyver. Yeah. He's a metal strand and a racer and a paperclip, essentially. <laughs> just, like, just like. Nancy later yeah. on just goes, oh, I used a nail file. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but this is this is one of the, this is one of the, like the pure Bond things where it just stretches into like th- this only would happen in the Bond movie, where it's uh like Bond goes into Ruby's room and they have a little bit of playful talk- talking and flirting and then they fuck and then afterwards it's interrupted by the fact that this uh, Blofeld hypnosis <laughs> tape that's being played through, <laughs> but then Bond leaves, goes back to his own room and there's a woman that's escaped and like. Uh, from our own room with the nail file and got in there then and bond uses the exact same yep. <laughs> that he uses on ruby onto her and then he's just like he's got the stamina for two in one night it's just like yep that's bond <laughs> and they imply maybe three in one night because later on with the uh oh yeah um, the curling thing where he says like i'll meet you at eight i'll meet you at nine ten, ten. <laughs> <laughs> i love that it's exactly the same lines that it works <laughs> It's, just like... it's so bond it's so bond like i know again there is the issue that some people will bring up with this sort of thing is the fact that he's supposed to be in love with tracy and so now he's just fucking up with every single woman under the sun my first argument to that would be one it's bond so he's going to do the, do this sort of thing bond has only got so much willpower mm-hmm. and he clearly is clearly lacking in that department two he doesn't really demonstrate his true feelings towards tracy until later in the movie so even though they've been getting to know each other, there's no real es- established connection there until like, their conversations later on. So I'm kind of I'm kind of okay with him doing it. And again, you kind of have to have this aspect in a Bond movie, otherwise it doesn't feel like a Bond movie. Yeah, and he's earned some points over Connery in that at least he's not saying, yes, I will fuck you into submission. It, he's just having a little bit of fun. He's established earlier in the film. He's a bachelor, he's not looking to settle down. This is just good. I mean, I'd argue even more if people are like, why is he doing this? He's on a mission. Yeah, he's on a mission. Like and he's are really up for it. <laughs> he's trying to get through them to Blofeld and figure out what's going on. He's not doing this just for fun. Like he was on his two-week vacation and he's fucking somebody that was at M's place, you know? Like yeah. I mean, he's going through them in more ways than one, obviously, but it's just because yeah. <laughs> and, then, and this is where um you mentioned the fact of the um, unintentional nudity. Really, yeah. You get that. So now it's one of those things where it's like those people that try and find that one screen grab yep. and grab it and stuff like that. So it's not like it's vividly on the screen or anything like that but you just get that one instance where she's putting the tap and putting the bed sheet over her and you just get to see a little bit in there yeah i i never noticed it and then when you're looking under like trivia you're like wait there's nudity in this and i'm like oh yeah okay i can see that it's a nipple relax you know (laughs) yeah Yeah, exactly (laughs) i also have a note down here that i thought was hilarious the line i have taught you to love chickens (laughs) (laughs) i mean you see the way she was eating it (laughs) <laughs> yeah, she fucking does. You know, if she just found the right chicken to dominate, <laughs> then the, she I wouldn't have the allergy anymore. Here, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I don't know about you guys, but at this point in the film, I'm thinking to myself, this movie could use some curling. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like, literally, they, they chose... I mean, part of this movie seems like it's an advertisement for the Winter Olympics. <laughs> I mean, they like, literally have the Olympic guys, so, uh, you know. Yeah, I know. It's just like... Uh, uh, again, curling's not exactly the most exhilarating sport, but then again, if you've got like like half a, like a dozen beautiful women doing it, then it gets a little bit more entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Bond goes back into Ruby's room, and surprise, it's Irma Bunt in the bed instead, and they knock him over the head, and there's this goofy fucking shot of him getting all woozy, like a Looney Tunes mm. bit or something. Yeah, Terrible. Well, at least, the, at least they kept the camera in one place at that point. <laughs> <laughs> they yeah. could have sped it up and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and flips it over like reverse forward reverse forward and had some burr, burr, burr. <laughs> nah this needed total focus and no editing at all yeah they went like one step away from having the little birds flying around his head mm. that they do uh bond's associate again sean you wouldn't know because he doesn't say a word in the entire film he gets killed after he's trying to climb the mountain he has, a, he has a pretty um he has a pretty serious argument with uh blowfield about like <laughs> him being allowed to climb up the the uh, mountain and stuff like that. What about my stuff? <laughs> yeah. 
uh, RIP to the guy we have no emotional connection with. Okay. And um, yeah, Blofeld's I mean, big plan. Go ahead. I was going to say, even though I have no real emotional connection to the guy, because again, we don't learn a huge amount about him. We know enough from the different scenes in the movie, like him helping Bond get the thing up to the the uh, the safe cracker into the room, and him keeping an eye on Bond while from like an opposite ski lodge and stuff like that. That he is connected with him, and I think the actual image of his death makes you feel sorry for him. It is a good death, like a uh, yeah. reveal. Yeah, so I think that's that's enough. You don't really need to know this guy in any great detail. Obviously, it would be better, but. Again, the movie's already two and a half hours long, so you really want to spend like fifteen minutes doing an exposition on Sean. Like you don't really yeah. need it. Maybe five, maybe like two minutes would have been fine, but it's still the, the vividness of his death or the way that he looks in death was enough for me to make feel like first of all, feel sorry for him, and second of all, go, wow, this blow field is all kinds of fucked up, and he's so much better than the previous one. So yeah, he feels uh, just to cap what Calm said there. This blow field feels more threatening than the last one. See, I always think that the the Blofeld that we don't get to see is the more threatening one. The one from, from Russia with Love and Thunderball. Oh, yeah. It, this it, one's it, not it, as goofy as... Uh, 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 sometimes he's a little bit goofy when we get later on. But Well, yeah, I, I, like you say, it's like it's definitely, it's definitely the better one. It's the one where he's just like the big head, essentially like controlling all the pawns around him. But... In terms of, like, now that you've established that Blofeld, you've seen his face in the previous movie. Obviously not this face, but you have seen his face in the movie, and you've established him as, like, a character beyond just being the big head. If you have to actually give him the face and the body and him actually being in this, I don't think he would do much better than this guy. Like, he was so good in the role. Uh, Blofeld's uh, big plan is bacterial warfare. He is threatening infertility with the virus Omega. And he doesn't just want millions of dollars. And he's like, oh, I'm not going to tell you everything, which is kind of good. No, no, I like that. Type of I also love the fact that this has nothing to do with nuclear weapons. Yeah, true. So that's that's an improvement as well. Yeah, I think uh, germ warfare is a lot scarier, actually. Then I've got a note that says the movie remembers this is an action film <laughs> where we have like eight action sequences in a row. They just cram it all in here. God damn. Now we got the sirens going off again. Uh, Bond escapes. Uh, yeah, that's why he escapes with the ski lift stuff. And apparently, a stuntman really did hang on the wires there, which seems horribly dangerous, and they, they could have done that much safer. But whatever. This was back in the era where it's like, just fucking do it. <laughs> yeah. And honestly, I kind of feel like it drags. They're setting up like the compacts that the Angels of Death have, and Bond's trying to get on down the mountain and. I don't like any of it up until you get to the ski sequence. I mean, I kind of like the side of it because Bond gets trapped in his room and he's having to get out the ski lift instead. And there's this one point where he nearly gets like caught in the gears because the ski lift's coming up and he's like being dragged all the way down. I like the ingenuity of using his uh, his pockets to protect his hands as he's climbing up. Uh, but yeah, I like the fact that it like, lands on the ski lift again the way that he lands on the ski lift from the angle that he was jumping from is is literally impossible. Like, yeah. you can't actually do it. But again, a bit of creative license. And the girls are then drugged via the eggnog, and they get this final talking to from Blofeld. So I think, again, it's not action-packed by any stretch of the imagination, but I kind of like the fact that it's setting up the action because it makes the action feel more important rather than if it was just, like, action all over the place every single bit of action feels a little bit uh, more meaningless to me rather than like they built up a lot of exposition here before they get into it. So yeah, I, I, maybe that's why I like Dr. No more than you guys have said in the past. Cause I don't really mind the exposition and less like, like explosion-y action, action packed sequences. I like when Bond's being stealthy. And I like when they're doing some investigation work and everything. To me, I just thought that this was kind of like flat, like this particular thing. Because I do like the That's ski fun. sequence outside of the fact that Blofeld is apparently a really good skier and a little bit goofy. And obviously the way that they filmed it, it's not as good as they can film yeah. things now. And, you know, but the pacing's just weird in this movie. Like we went a long time without action. And then the action goes on for a really long time. One sequence yeah. after another, like they forgot about it and then shoehorned in 
well, instead of him escaping and then just being in the town, let's have him escape in an action sequence. And then he skis down and then he's being chased in the town. And then there's a car sequence and then there's another ski sequence. And then they're like, you know, it kind of is like they're making up for the fact that they didn't do that the rest of the film. Because really, what was the last action sequence before that? It would have been like when he was fighting the the guy in the hotel. Yeah, yeah, it would be yeah the the guys leading him into Draco probably. Oh yeah, that a little bit after that. So yeah, it's it's, it's yeah. kind of just I don't know. Yeah it's, um, yeah, it's been a lot. It's been a lot more like of a subdued Bond movie, but that's almost why I kind of like it more because it just feels more fleshed out than just a load of action sequences. See, and I, I agree with Callum there as well. Like, I don't think you need to like oh well we gotta have action let's uh shoehorn a car exploding here let's you know have some random henchman die a nonsensical death like it's okay to take a departure every now and again and it seems like this movie was trying to do that in several ways i think i i would have done something maybe like midway through doing the whole stuff with the girls one of the guards would have caught him doing that and he would have had an action sequence and thrown the guy off the uh, mountainside or whatever. And then it's like, Oh, what happened to that guy? He didn't report today. Okay. Well, something's going on here. And then Blofeld starts looking into it or, you know, like to kind of like every certain amount of pages have an action thing that if it, if it feels natural, obviously. Yeah. I mean, the the, the funny thing about the idea that uh, Blofeld catches Bond out because he, he said that where the, uh, the team was in the wrong place. Yeah, he's done his research too. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, yeah, he's done his research. He knows all this stuff. I mean, a tweet he's trying to become the count of that entire area, so you can understand that he'd know all that stuff. But to be fair, it's more also backed over me, like the thing that I don't really mind it too much that there's less action because when they do do the action sequences, like the skiing sequence, it's really, really good. i tell you something I don't like about this movie, though, because it's weird. You get a random-ass jump scare with a polar bear taking pictures. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh we're not we're not we're not skipping over the entire like the hint skiing down the mountain are we because this is awesome no, no. stuff uh, I, I know that that's that's right at the end that's why i was worried that we're just skipping over the fact that at one point because first of all the thing that i love about this skiing sequence is that yes you do have the shots of like the close-up shots of laser these like laser these face with the um the motion picture behind it but then the rest of it is being done by stuntmen who are actual skiers and the shot of whoever the skier they managed to find that can ski down a mountain on one ski mm-hmm. is like he should be like like knighted or something for that for that work because it's just absolutely incredible. I don't know how you can train to do that sort of thing. Yeah, I like the skiing stuff in this better than some of the other films because skiing becomes a trope in the Bond franchise. They do it in at least like four other ones. Oh, we'll talk about the uh, the CGI down the down the mountain thing but, yeah. <laughs> but the uh there's there's some good stuff there and that is like some more not brutal but more like i don't know visceral i guess the action would be like he grabs the um the one uh ski and smacks the other guy with it, and the guy flies oh. off and whatever and you can get we, to see we, him fall all the way down <laughs> no yeah can we t- literally that was the first time in this not well, maybe not the first time but one of the, the biggest time in this entire franchise i've literally burst out laughing <laughs> because he goes to, like he hits it and we see this skier falling for 20 about 15 20 seconds of him just going all the way down the mountain and it's just hilarious i was thinking oh my god they gotta show this entire thing oh my god they're showing this entire thing it's just going and going and going oh I was and it ends with <laughs> That seems like more of the fodder that some of the Austin Powers movies would later rip off of. Like, okay, let's just watch this guy tumble <laughs> all the way down. No, but that, that's the sign that just turns like any random henchman death into a completely memorable and yeah. just like like that henchman, like that extra in this movie, just has like this iconic part of it. And obviously, it's not him; it's a giant dummy falling down the entire way down. But that 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 makes the characters feel like you can actually like say henchman falling off cliff is like having lifted the credits there now they right. did that one for real too right, okay. <laughs> same guy who was hanging off yeah. the cable car it's just I mean, the only, yeah i mean the only thing it missed is like uh like him just landing and then it just bursting flames randomly yeah that would be great uh we get that though and eventually it's just like hey for some reason tracy's here she happened to tell her dad that she wanted to go see where bond is and he's like oh he's around there so she goes to see him and it, it feels manufactured to me and unbelievable like they forgot that she had 
not been a part of the film and they just throw her in there. Like, remember her? Uh, I don't see it like that. No, I don't. No, I I think, again, there is that definite argument. I think it can come across as manufactured. I feel it's a bit more just serendipitous. I would have liked to have seen her be part of the story going on here. That's fair. Like, uh, again, it's fair for Maybe like I don't know I don't know how you would do this I didn't I plan it out but like maybe maybe she could have had some kind of an allergy and they could have pretended that like she well, was so the she, one going to be one of the girls and stuff like that yeah like she could have been like oh I'm auditioning to be one of the other girls that they want to do for this allergy type of thing and you know like it's I don't know I, don't know. I mean I ca- I kind of like it just because of the way the movie's done in the sense that again it's again it's a bit more like romantic comedy sort of trope but it's the idea that he just like he's in a really sticky situation and then Tracy's there to help him get out of it when just when he needs her there. And again, it's, it's a little bit unbelievable. It's a little bit manufactured, but sometimes some of that hokey manufactured crap can actually just add to the story to me. I just feel like, yeah, this would never happen in real life. But then again, most of the stuff that happens in Bond movies would never happen in real life. So I'm okay. Right. And I think this was the perfect moment for this film in particular, where she didn't need to be, you know, a part of the actual scheme itself. She's, she's happy to be there. I never like when movies have a, a thing where it just happens to move to the next thing, no matter what movie it is. If it's like, well, and then they show up because we want them there. I never like that. So do you think that you obviously said that this is one of, if not your least favorite film. Do you think that you've just, come into this with all the preconceived notions and nothing was going to crack. No, I I really, really wanted to like this so much more. Like, but you also had that subconscious, like knowing that, uh, you might not, you, you know, that this is a different kind of film. I don't, I I mean, I don't think any of Tony's criticisms are unfair or anything that he said is like, I'm completely in disagreement with. I mean, I see it in a different perspective than he does, where I'm seeing it as like positives, whereas in some things he's seeing as negatives. And I don't think either of us saw, and again, like you're seeing a lot of things in the positive light as well, Rob, and I don't think either of us is wrong in our perspective of it. It's just a different white outlook of looking at, looking at it. Yeah, some people think that this is far and above the best Bond film. Yeah. yeah and I'm like, but- man, I, it, just a film... I don't like how they do a lot of it. No, that's fair. And I, I'm kind of like in the almost complete opposite boat. I just think like as a movie, uh, to me, this doesn't strike me as like a particularly Bond quote unquote movie. I just think it's a really, really good movie. So like I, like- I think that when they they do the whole barn thing, I think it, it feels weird that they kind of come action scene, action scene, action scene, screeching halt. He proposes mm. to her. And then they just pick up back up with another action scene. I don't like that. Yeah, that, that there are elements where it does feel like it just goes up and down very quickly. I'm, I almost kind of like that aspect of it. That it's not like it. It doesn't need to. For me, it doesn't need to have a consistent rhythm to it. I kind of like that. It's just like it has the action things you want to see from Bond, but then it shows a little bit more just character development, which is something I've been screaming out for for this entire franchise. So I'm, right. maybe. Maybe I'm kind of like that's rose tinting it a little bit more for me, but I still just enjoy that aspect of it. Hey, listen, the next film, as I understand it, is going to get batshit crazy. So, oh, it totally is. <laughs> Fundamentally, this movie is a better movie than Diamonds Are Forever. That's good. Diamonds Are Forever is just more fun because it's fucking weird. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I'm looking forward to those aspects of movies as well, but I just, it was just, again, because of the way that I've heard you describe it in the past, and I've heard other people describe it in the past, especially with Lanes and Bean's involvement, it's just like, I was always painting a picture that this is going to be just a flat out bad movie, and I'm not going to yeah. feel like this is Bond at all or anything like that, and part of me feels like, I didn't feel like this is a Bond movie, but it almost made me, not so much enjoy it more, but just like, just enjoy it for its own merits. Fair enough. I have a note down. Um, they gleefully ski for a moment until they realize Blofeld and them are still alive, <laughs> not on the trail. Uh, one guy falls oh. into a machine and the snow turns blood red. And Bond says he had a lot of guts. That's a bad one. That's that's one of, I didn't like that one. One of the <laughs> least inspired quips of the series. <laughs> no, but oh, first of all, we have to talk about a lot of this because we've, we've gone through the, the guts of it. I know we're, obviously this one's already going a little bit long anyway, but I feel there's a lot to talk about, but. First of all, that that death is gruesome. It's probably the most gruesome death I've seen so far in this entire franchise, and it's like yeah. that, that part of it I actually quite like about it. You're gonna um, get a worse one in License to Kill, but this is up there. Yeah, 
um they do the thing where they like do the ice the join the ice race and they're bouncing around all over the place and um like on one point tracy says the line i hope my big end can stand up to this it's <laughs> <laughs> like i thought that was kind of funny um bond kissing her on the cheek constantly whenever she does something good while she's driving was a little bit like <laughs> was a little odd but um, and the, the get out, like the uh, villain's car explodes, obviously, but they all manage to get out this time, which is, I guess, a slightly different take on the meme. Um, Tracy says we didn't even stay for the prize. Another good line. She's, she seems like she seems like she's Bond, almost. She seems like the quote, closest equivalent that we've had to a Bond girl that's like Bond. Well, she does get the name, briefly. Yeah, yeah <laughs> for about 10 minutes. <laughs> and then um, they do the uh, the uh, scene in the in the barn where you get to, like... I I love this scene because it's just like a nice little exposition about like James, like Bond talks about like how being an agent means that he's own he was trained to only care for himself, and then he realizes that because he loves Tracy, he can't be an agent anymore because he can't like he's had that little he's had that fun flurry of like things to do and stuff like that, but now he's found the woman that he wants to spend the rest of his life with. So he realizes he can't live that lifestyle anymore. And I kind of like that little reflective look that he has on this entire thing. And then they, like, she agrees to marry him. They banter about where they're going to live because these two actually seem to be fairly just like respectful and almost on equal levels at this point. And then they talk about, like, Bond says that he's not going to make love to her, stay to the wedding night. But then yeah. a little bit of the Bond still remains, and he hits the the little bunk that she's leaning down. So she, she falls on top of it and says, well, it's not New Year's yet. So it's like, that's going to be his New Year's re- resolution to be more faithful. Yeah. It's like, eh, that's not New Year's resolution yet. We'll just do this instead. It's just like, eh, it's, I, I thought I thought that was really that was a really cute segment. I th- like, again, like, there's elements of this movie I really, really like. And I think if written better, they are amazing. So it's like you put that type of a scene in a different context and a different movie where they've built up more of the relationship. I buy it more and then I really That's like fair. it. That's fair. But then I grew up on a lot of Disney movies where people just fall in love. Like in, like, That's true. Like in, in, in half a frame pretty much. So I kind of was <laughs> OK with the way this played out. Uh, let's see. Attack on Blofeld's base. Tracy's captured. M and all the stuffy government people, of course, are like, oh, well, we don't, you know, we're going to wash our hands of this whole situation. We could just let her die. <laughs> so Bond and Draco siege the facility. And uh, I don't dig the whole flirty Blofeld Tracy stuff that's going on. I kind of like that she's sort of keeping her wits end about it, but it kind of goes on forever while yes. we're doing this whole setup of Bond and Draco in the helicopter. I think you could, for brevity, you know, the movie is long, but you can kind of not stretch it out as much. Mm. Yeah, so <laughs> so that's yeah, again a bit to unpack. So M revealed that Blofeld's price was he wants amnesty from all past crimes, and the recognition of his title was Count the Blowshom, so he gets to be live as a count and have the royalties that are associated with it afterwards. So that's basically what he wants. He wants to get out and make sure that he's never going to be threatened by Bond or any other uh, police force ever again. Not a bad plot. Um, yeah, hmm? yeah. Um. I like the fact that it's like this is a real point of contention between M and Bond. This is the most we've seen them like at loggerheads with each other because Bond wants to go and save Tracy and, and deal with Blofeld and M saying, well, my hands are tied in the Blofeld thing and Tracy's not my problem. She's your problem. Mm-hmm. And that's like a real point of contention with him as well. And so he basically he's like it's almost like the enemy of my enemy is my friend with draco even though obviously we've seen him be cordial with draco draco is still a villain a pseudo villain almost yeah i mean he's still a smuggler and everything like yeah but he goes to help and they pretend to be a red cross flight and they go over there tracy but the thing i don't like about the blofeld side of things because that tracy was very anti blofeld and then she becomes very for blofeld and blofeld falls for it yeah it's not exactly the smartest thing so but again villains i almost i'm almost more forgiving of villains that are stupid it's the same way like in wrestling it's okay if the heels are stupid every now and again because they're just pompous and arrogant they just assume that eventually people are going to bend to their whims so i've got a note here that says blah 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 let's go bobsledding (laughs) i mean that's that's a great advice yeah We, we get to see all the explosives in the in the fight scene the flamethrowers and bottles 
I love the fact that Tracy beats a guard by herself. Yeah. That's great. She's a strong woman who don't need no man. Yeah, very capable. Like she like he overpowers her at one point, but she scratches him, kills him, throws him into spikes to kill him. <laughs> Just like, yeah, that was okay, this woman's great. Um one thing I don't like is uh Draco punching her out in the uh, <laughs> before getting into the helicopter. It's like, um I, I don't know. Like part I'm in really two minds about this thing because first of all, no, don't punch your daughter in the face. That's really bad. That's like you shouldn't do that. But then he's doing it to protect her in the lo- right. scheme of things because he doesn't want her to go back in and be caught in the crossfire because they're about to blow this place up. And if that's the only way he th- in the moment that he felt that he could incapacitate her enough to get her in, then fair enough. It just it isn't no, a great, it's still a great image. No. Nope. Not it's the most accident. it's the most forgivable out of all the times that somebody that should be positive for her life does something bad. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's that's the way that I'm kind of trying to look at it, but it's not a great visual. I can mm-hmm. understand Rob you saying that yeah, it's not it's not good at all. So this is not the last time we get a bobsledding action sequence in this series. <laughs> There's at least one more. It's filmed awkwardly, bad rear projection. There's a grenade that takes like five minutes to explode. Mm. And it ends with drops it down the bobsled. Yeah, it, like, like a Mr. Bean movie almost. So. Blofeld gets snared up in some branches. And Bond's got this worst line. Oh, he branched himself. What the fuck does that even mean? No, he said he. He says he branched off. Or branched up. That's what it is. Uh, no, no, branched off. Branched off. Yeah, it's essentially again. It's probably a pretty British colloquialism, but it's like if you have multiple branches or something. Like you're a business and you branched off to another location or something like that. Branched off makes a lot more sense. I thought that he had said branched up. That's the note that I wrote to myself. I'm like, what the fuck does branched up mean? Like, you know. No, he doesn't say it very well because at the end of the day, he's going down a bobsled, so he probably doesn't have time to be as piffy as he wants to be. (laughs) But um, but yeah, I I was I was disappointed when I thought that that was Blofeld's death. Yeah. I thought that was very anticlimactic. Obviously, we find out later on that he's not dead. But at that point, I just feels like. Oh, he broke his neck on the branches. That feels like a pretty low key way for Bond's supposedly major villain to die. But when they fix it at the end, it's just like, okay, that's that's fine then. That's just a way for Bond to assume that he's dead when he actually isn't. What's better, uh, this movie in bobsledding or Cool Runnings? I was almost thinking, ah. it's, it's Cool Runnings, the other Bond, Bond movie that has the uh... <laughs> <laughs> Cool Runnings. <laughs> So I hear some wedding bells. Um, we get into the wedding stuff. Q and Money Penny and M are there. Uh, I like that M and Drake are chatting it up about how they've kind of fucked each other over in the past. <laughs> yeah, Money Penny's so upset. Uh, she's Q, cry- she's crying. Q calls Bond irresponsible, and he's like, you know, we haven't seen eye to eye all the time, but if you need anything, which is like, oh, that's nice. Draco's got to throw in another line there. He says, "Obey your hus- uh, obey your husband above all things." But he tries to give Bond the money back. Uh, he gives the money, and Bond gives the money back, and, you know, good little moment there. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I like the fact that when Tracy hears him say, like, obey him, and says, like, obey him as much as... It's, it says something like, obey him as much as he obeyed his previous command or something like that. It's just like, she's clearly saying, like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. So that's like... So good for her. So I'm fine with that, yeah. Uh, great little Tracy moment uh, with Money Penny. She's sad, and Bond throws his hat to her. I like that. It would have been so much better if it would have been Cottery doing that. Imagine that. Again, like, I can't, obviously we will never know because he wasn't part of this, but I almost feel like it would have been good for Connery to get this sort of Bond movie. Because the rest of the, cause it just feels like he would have added more as the character to it than Lazenby. And again, I don't think Lazenby did bad. And I would like to have seen Lazenby do more off the back of this. But yeah, it would, it would have been interesting to see Connery in this type of movie. I think had Connery been in the movie it would have felt full circle in the way of like, ah, you know, I've realized that, you know, I came into this and I can only care about myself and now I care about you. So I'm leaving this behind actually. And it would have been better in that regard, but it also almost is poetic that, yeah, he's a different kind of person now because he's a different person (laughs) now. This kind of shit never happened to the other fella. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Especially that ending. So Bond and Tracy drive off. Tracy's talking about she wants three girls, three boys, and you know, that's a good for a start and whatever. And Bond says the the line, we have all the time in the world. And he stops to take the flowers off the car. And then out of nowhere, Irma Bunt and Blofeld in a neck brace 
drive by, shoot the fucking car up. Tracy's struck in the head. She's dead. Yeah. What were you guys thinking at this point in the movie? Oh, that's what Tony meant when he said that this next one isn't going <laughs> to end like all the others. Yeah. So, the, the end, I just need to talk about this. I need to go off in it a little bit in a, in a, in a good way. So, I like the fact that there's context to the reason why Bond takes the flowers off of it. It's not just that they just stop randomly because essentially they had some hippies fly past them in another car or whatever. And Bond says, oh, we look like a flower shop dressed like this right now. So I'm just going to take the stop off, take the flowers off so we can just drive up in peace. Don't have to be disturbed by anyone else. They have the bloke bloke building in a neck brace looks like ridiculous. But again, it's a a little bit of like Bond ridiculousness at the end with um, them shooting the car up. I just had the bond immediately. His immediate thing is like call to action. Need to go after him. He's still alive. We need to get him. Then he just looks and sees the bullet in the head, which is graphic for this type of movie at this point, because they've usually done more of a job of like hiding stuff or subverting it. Like in, in um something in like uh, uh, uh the previous movie. You only have uh, twice. Mate. Yeah, you only have twice. Where they have the uh, ninjas going in with the samurai swords, and strange enough, they don't cut anybody. <laughs> like that sort mm-hmm. of that's like a subversion of it. Whereas this time you see the bullet hole in the head, the blood pouring down, de- the blood going down, trickling down. Obviously, it's not super graphic, but it's enough. And then it's just the thing with the police car, the police bike going by, and, and Bond just there with her, and just saying, "Oh, she's just tired. It's been a long day." And talks about, and there's the line says, "Like it's fine. We have we have all the time in the world." That ending, that ending pushed it for me where I was like, in my mind, I was going, I wonder if I like this more than Thunderball or is Thunderball like similar levels for me. And that ending pushed it miles over for me. It was, that is, I don't think we'll see a better ending in this entire series in my mind. And again, I, I will love to be proven wrong, but for me, that ending is an absolute delight. Brilliantly done. Now, where does this novel fit in with the other novels so dr no is not the first novel it's casino royale and you go through a couple of these other ones because like for instance like moonraker doesn't really follow the plot of moonraker a whole lot it, it they've changed it around and the spy who loved me is not really the spy who loved me in a lot of ways and some other things are short stories that they make into bigger stories like uh, octopussy is uh Octopussy and the Living Daylights. So, of course, that's a different movie. And, yeah, you know, like uh, different things like that. But essentially, once you get past, like, Live and Let Die and uh, Goldfinger and um, From Russia with Love and all these other kind of things, uh, From Russia with Love is at the point where they know who Bond is, kind of. And, um, they well let's put it this way on her majesty's secret service is when he meets blofeld if i remember correctly and that's why they do the whole thing where he can go all along this whole plot and blofeld doesn't know who he is and everything and he doesn't know who blofeld is necessarily but after this happens bond goes on the revenge missions and you end up with you only live twice where he fakes his own death so he can get through the system because they know who bond is at this point, just like they know who bond is and you only live twice and you only live twice is when he kills Blofeld. Ha. Now I was only asking because I had read something that said in the novels after this death, he like spirals. Yeah. You know, and it actually takes a great toll on him, which I think would have been better to see, you know, like I have this feeling that Bond is just going to be like, ah, you know, such is life. Yeah. There's, there. there's no real payoff in the next film. Yeah. That's an issue. Yeah, that, that's absolutely going to suck with that side of it. But it's just, I, I can't like, like future, hate this movie in that regard. I don't know how to describe but I can't I can't give this movie sins for what the future movies will do to it oh no that's entirely a problem of Diamonds Are Forever yeah absolutely and so that, that'll be the problem I'll have with that movie but it's partially not their fault the actress who played Irma Bunt died a few days after this movie was released so they couldn't do anything with Irma Bunt 
but they completely botch Blofeld in the next film. Cause it's, it's weird. It's like this movie ends with a bullet hole in a windshield and Bond's wife is dead. And then it's just ba da 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 da. It's like, what the fuck? You're going to end like that? So yeah, I, yeah, that's, I love the ending. Yeah, the ending's so so good. It just, I mean, again, say what you will about Lays and D and stuff like that. And obviously, again, for most of the movie, you probably would prefer Connery or another Bond to be in place there. But I think he really sells the final scene really well. And that's arguably the hardest scene to do in the entire movie. And I think he pulls it off perfectly. I don't like yeah, it as much as other moments that are in the franchise that Bond does better i think which we haven't gotten to with some of those yet so i mean you know if you're going through one by one then yeah again i'm not saying that another bomb wouldn't have pulled it off better or just as well but i feel like that was the moment where i just like looked at that scene and thought yeah i would have liked to have seen him in the next movie yeah you you think at this point that this movie is going to go like oh man that next movie is going to be brutal he's going to be you know i gotta fucking kill blofeld and all this and you'll see and uh, mm, yeah. from what I've seen in the trailer, it's not that. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, maybe, I, I don't know, like, subconsciously, maybe people felt with this movie, and not, maybe not to the same way, like, you taking even negatives or us taking positives out of it. Maybe they just felt like this was too much of a departure. Yeah. And so they decided to step away a bit. And I I was, me personally, and I think Rob's in the same boat, I was, I was happy for the departure slightly to, to be slightly different than the previous ones we've seen beforehand but i assume a lot of other people weren't as happy with it and so they decided to revert to type yeah in a lot yeah. of ways and then they they up the camp and they yeah so they... i i want more of this not more of it like i a little bit more action yes but i like the story told I even like the ending, and I like how it's not just, ah, you know, we've survived, let's fuck, and credits roll. You know, it's just like, it it feels like it strikes a chord. And, you know, if you're a fan at this point and you've gone to all the movies, you're like, oh, yeah, you know, I can't wait. And I probably you're let down by the next one because it's just batshit crazy. Yeah, it's just, like this feels like the Bond equivalent to the ending of Empire Strikes Back, mm-hmm. where it's like you don't always have to end it with like Bond's the hero and he's got the girl and everything's just going to be hunky dory and he's going to be back in the next movie, just all kind back, all action packed. You feel like in this one, there's consequences and there's gravitas to it, and obviously, like you say, it won't be followed up on, and that's the fault of the following movie and the people that produced it. But yeah, at this point, you just feel like, wow, this the next Bond movie is going to be a fucking no a fucking like bloodbath almost because he's gonna yeah. <laughs> do anything in, in his power to get blowfield and make him pay for this and yeah so i it's almost like if that the fact that you've already told me that's not going to happen in um in diamonds of forever is almost certainly like put that in the lower end of the spectrum already just going into it because it feel, it, again, it just I, I, maybe I shouldn't be hating that movie because of the sins of the past, but the sins of the, or, or the way the past influenced it. But that's more annoying to me than the stuff in the like. The, I can't hate this movie stuff that happens in the future because they have no control over it. Whereas people that made Diamonds of Forever, they, they I assume they saw yeah uh, <laughs> Secret Service, so they on a Magic Secret Service, so they should know what they should do with it based on that thing, and they go and opposite direction or a different direction and that's not right is there a callback to this at any point in time uh if one might say something like on the lines of like i was in love once or something like that any kind of callback ever in the across the last 21 years 22 years oh uh to any other films yeah just in no, oh yeah not diamonds are forever but like other ones oh they uh he yeah they there's some good moments. There's a really, really good moment in Spy Who Loved Me. There's a really stupid, there's a really good moment in For Your Eyes Only that's followed with a really, really stupid moment. And I'll spoil this one. Uh, in The World Is Not Enough, uh, for instance, Electra at some point, she says, uh, have you ever lost anyone, Mr. Bond? And he just looks off to the side and he's like, all right, like right, let's talk about something else or whatever. And 
my favorite one of the all time is when we get to license to kill. That one is, it's like it, it, it kind of punches you in the gut a little bit, but um, they do that so much better because the next one, the closest you can get to it is he says to Blofeld at one point, Welcome to hell, Blofeld. <laughs> That's the closest you get to it, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. All right, so we're that sucks. We're already going into diamonds with tempered expectations, but I also know it's gonna be batshit crazy, and I'm kind of here for that so diamonds is a fucking know. hoot it's dumb as shit <laughs> it's, it's so good um one of the other ideas that they had for this movie was that they were going to have gert fro back and he was going to play goldfinger's twin brother <laughs> and that they were going to make goldfinger potentially the brother of goldfeld uh, of blofeld which would have been goldfeld <laughs> uh which would have been really stupid uh, goldfinger be silver toe instead or something like that. yeah <laughs> <laughs> So ultimately, here's the how we're going to go through it again. Um, gadgets. We had radioactive lint that wasn't used. We have a safe cracker that's not as useful as the other one. And that's it. I'm going to go thumbs down on the gadgets. Yeah, I'm going to go thumbs, thumbs down. down. For, for gadgets one, yeah. Music. The opening titles, and we have all the time in the world, and the song that you guys can't remember that I absolutely hate. Uh, I go thumbs up on the main theme outside of the fact that it's the main theme. That's kind of a shame. I go thumbs up on we have all the time in the world and I go real thumbs down on do you know where Christmas trees are grown? I'm going to go thumbs up all around just because none of it's offensive to me. So thumbs up. Yeah, I'd, I'd go thumbs in the middle leaning thumbs up probably because none of it was egregious in any way. I, I'm, the thumbs down would, for me would be for the opening theme, not just because not because I hate the music in any way. It's just it doesn't feel like an opening thing. What do you guys think about the title? Hate it. Yeah, not fan. Yeah, not uh, not rolls off the tongue or anything like that. I always thought that the one of the titles that they could have used, uh, it wasn't at the time. They it, it wasn't obviously they were going with the names of the books mostly, but um, they haven't used this title yet. But for special services, I'm like sounds kind of a little bit boring, but it's a little bit easier to man uh, maintain than on Her Majesty's Secret Service. But whatever. Uh, action. I think that this is. Good. It's not great in some ways. I hate the speed up stuff, but I like that he does a better part with the action stuff than Connery. It doesn't. So as we said very early on, uh, he seems like he's actually doing the fighting, which is better. I hate the way the fights were shot and none of the scenes stand out. So I'm going to say thumbs down. I'm going two big thumbs up for the action, personally. I just think that the bits that, even though action is not like a prevailing theme in the entire movie, the bits that it does do, it does well. I mean, I like the Tracy fighting off the the guard scene. I like uh, the skiing sequence. I thought think is great, and the like driving through the the race part. I thought was a lot of fun as well. So yeah, I think the action that it does provide does it for me. On the humor side. I don't think it's as good. I think that it's too silly. I I I found it pretty funny. I don't know, honestly, I kind of liked a lot of the writing side of it. A lot of some of it, like the guts part and uh, maybe branching off, is a little bit too over the top. But I think certain certain parts of it, like I'm trying to pick out certain lines, but the stuff that he, the little uh, exchanges he has with Tracy and stuff like that, and the uh the hitting the calendar and stuff like that and I do love that. elements I think yeah I think I think overall it was a thumbs up for me there are bits of it that go over the top but I I like bits of it I'd say thumbs up for me you know I like I said really all throughout this thing I think at the end of the day it's going to be middle of the road overall but I've enjoyed my experience with this film on the villains you've got Blofeld and you've got Irma Bunt. Not my favorite Blofeld, my second least favorite, or even my least favorite. I don't know. I'm not as big on Blofeld as you are uh, with this. Irma Bunt's good. Not great. Good. Irma Bunt is good, but we've already said she's a, a bit of a knockoff of another character. And I enjoyed Blofeld, so I'd say thumbs up, but not like blow me away, two thumbs way up kind of thing. I really like Blofeld. I thought he was very vicious, very conniving. He was clearly intelligent. He had Bond's number in a number of ways as well. He got a little bit too, um, I would say goofy, but a little bit too 
uh, stupid towards the end with the the Tracy thing, but I think overall he was a really good villain. Some, one of the best ones in my mind that we've seen so far. And yeah, no, Oma, Oma Bent was good. I don't think that like, she's particularly memorable, but I think she performed her role particularly well. So good. On the allies, you got Sean. <laughs> Poor bastard. I mean, he was there. He was there. He's just there. He did. I, I, I don't I think, think he yeah, really think deserves he... a thumbs up or a thumbs down, really. No, I, mean, I mean, I give him a thumbs up for just like his death being poignant. Uh, poor guy. But I'll say, yeah, like Cal said, thumbs up because he had a a good death. But yeah, not memorable. How much of a thumbs down do we feel about Draco? <laughs> uh, it just there's 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 the weird dichotomy about Draco to yeah. me. He's and a good character, that, but it just happens to be really misogynist and terrible. Yeah, he, yeah he's, I mean, he's misogynist and terrible, which means that he, I'm sure Ian Fleming would have loved him. Cause, yeah. <laughs> so, because that's what the whole thing in the book entirely is. But, um, but like, as a person, I wouldn't like to hang out with him or I wouldn't like to, um, I wouldn't like to share his views about women and stuff like that. But as just like a help for Bond and somebody who just like has a bit of perspective on certain like just like he's he's not obviously a, a fully clean cut individual he's someone who's like on the outskirts of the law but is helping out bond i think that was it was a good character in that regard so i'd give him a thumbs up and the thing so in a weird way in his own way he is saying i care he just cares in a really shitty way that sucks but it's like in his mind, he's a good guy, so I guess that shines through. Um, let's see. On the well, we'll talk about allies uh, with the girls too, because obviously um, there's Tracy. I'm going to save her for last. But uh, on the other girls, you've got the the angels of death. Is what they're called. Uh, Ruby is a good character that I semi hate, but I love because of what I hate about her. All the rest uh, of them are Ruby. pretty pointless. Like Nancy doesn't have any. Like she's she's nobody. You know. No, no. Major, a lot of... major thumbs up on Ruby. Yeah, big thumbs up on Ruby. The rest of them are just. I mean, they're there for the eye candy aspect yeah. of it. Like the it's just it's just that one shot of Bond going up to that room and seeing all these gorgeous women in one place, yeah. and that's kind of. What we didn't there talk for. about it, but uh, just small note. One of them didn't say or wasn't going to say genealogy. What? Where is they? I almost feel like somebody was about to say gynecology. But <laughs> I don't remember that part. When he first goes in the room and tries to play off the character, I thought I heard that, but it's just... oh, no, no, because it's like she asks, like she wants to know what genealogy is, and I think someone tries to describe it as like gynecology because they don't actually know what it is, and so I think it's just she... it's. It's like because she couldn't say the word, she was going to say gynecology. <laughs> it's just, just yeah, yeah, she wasn't. I don't think she was like naturally English. The person that was saying it and stuff like that. So yeah, maybe that came out wrong and stuff like that. But yes, yeah, it's the idea of him explaining what genealogy is to everyone and stuff like that. It's just like I, again, like the scene, just the girl just hanging on his every single word because it's just because there's a man in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Ruby Bartlett, uh, she's just she's a character. Um, she I love though. Her voice. Uh, there's Tracy, of course, main ally, main girl, one of the hallmarks of this franchise. I really feel like she just doesn't get her, her due. Like I, I like her character so much and I want her character to be so much better. And I feel like they don't get to that level. Like she could have been above and beyond the best Bond girl. And I don't think that they actually tap into that until we get to Vesper Lind. No, I, I I completely agree that because of the time that it was produced and the fact that it's like the way the movies were created at this point in time, her character is one that could easily have been expanded on more, is one that should have been given more screen time than it actually was, should be more involved in the entire process of the thing than the bits they did get. But for me, it marked a huge step in the right direction. Her character was really well put together. She was strong. She was intelligent. She was just an excellent overall character. One that, as Tony says and rightly says, should have been fleshed out more. But for what we were given, I thought she is the she's been the best Bond girl so far. Uh, if we're saying she should have been fleshed out more, just in general, just in terms of like the way we know films 
today, I guess I would agree, but she is the most fleshed out Bond girl thus far. And I think she's perfect for the time. And I, first of all, I didn't even dive too deep into this, but when I first saw the character, I was like floored at how beautiful she was. I think this is thus far the best Bond girl we've seen. And they do get better. I mean, they the next film, Bond Girl, downgrade. Film after that, not as good. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, film after yeah, that, I'm, they try or they just pretend that it's better, but it isn't really. And then I think when you get, I'll make the case that Moonraker has a better Bond Girl than a lot of the other ones. And then they they do start getting a little bit better with that, but yeah. they well, they took a step in the right direction at the very least. It, it's almost like. You you want you want this movie to have been made later on, yeah. And they do give more screen time to that sort of thing because the character itself. But I think the reason why you think that is because the character was portrayed as well as it was for the time that it was in, because it shows that there was so much potential with that with the character with who was playing it. It's nothing to do with the person who was playing it. She was perfect, and yeah, it's just it just needed to be in a different time to really make the most of it. Unfortunately, the movie that basically tries to remake this in a lot of ways, people don't like. <laughs> so they oh, run into it. the same uh, mistakes with uh, Spectre in a lot of ways. Mm. So ultimately, uh, for me, if we're saying shaken or not stirred or whatever, I, at the end of the day, I'm not as big of a fan of this movie. I say stirred. It's shaken. Yep, shaken all the way. Yeah. I don't must be disappointed if this movie wasn't a split in some way. Like, you know, <laughs> cuz it, it is very indicative of like the way that the the fans of this franchise are. They are very staunch supporters or people like me that's just like I don't like so many parts of this and I really 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 want to. It's not the worst film of the bunch. It's not the stupidest. It doesn't have the the weakest characters, but enough of the elements come together for me to be like, damn it. And I almost resent it more because of its potential that it didn't tap into kind of. No. And I don't think I, any of us like begrudge each other for our different viewpoints and that side of things. Cause we, we do see the positives. We do acknowledge the negatives and that side of things as well. So it's not, like it's not a perfect movie by any stretch of imagination. And I do completely agree with Tony. It has way more potential than it shows, but that makes me almost like admire it more in the sense that I, I sat there for two and a half hours, thoroughly enjoyed every second, and realised that if this movie would be made in 2021, not 2021, because nothing's good in 2020 or 2021, yeah. <laughs> but in a few years down the line, if they were to remake this sort of thing and just like tighten up the fits that need to be sorted out and just flesh out the characters a little bit more in areas, then this might be not just even the greatest Bond movie of all time. I think it could be up there like an all-time classic movie of all time. I think um, I wouldn't go as far as Callum did saying no, that's classic fine. all-time movie, but good Bond film. Right now, I'll slap it in the middle of the road because it didn't strike me as iconic as Goldfinger, and I enjoyed Thunderball as well. But it's right underneath those because this was really good. So we got one on the total uh, top, one on the total bottom, and one somewhere in the middle. There you go. <laughs> And that's, good... why, that's why there's three of us, and that's why we have these discussions. <laughs> yeah. And I do I do appreciate the fact that we, like, because we're all just watching the same thing. We're watching the same thing going through all of it, and it's just like our ranking system at the moment is completely different across all of them. Yeah. But there's certain ones that we're in, like, similar agreement for. Like, we all agree that Goldfinger's a good movie. We all agree that Thunderball is good and stuff like that, and obviously to a certain degree and stuff like that. And we all agree that Doctor No is not the best yeah. Out of the litany of things, stuff like that, and we're not none of us are fans. As um, uh, you only did twice as well, to 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 a mass, two different varying extents, but we all think that overall that's on the negative side of things. Whereas this one is just all over the place. <laughs> but that's like you say, that's the thing that this movie like brings out of Bond fans, probably more arguably more than any other Bond movie, maybe. Yeah, there are apologists for every movie, and there's some. Every one of them is somebody's favorite. You know, some people are like the very first movie I ever saw was Octopussy, and then it's one I really, really love or something. And then you get somebody like me who I fall under the spectrum of 
where a lot of people do, where it was like, well, Golden Ice were the first one I really saw, and Golden Ice one of the better ones, I think. And then, you know, uh, somebody out there is like, Doctor knows the best, and they went downhill ever since the first, and you know. <laughs> but uh, I want to know what everybody else has to say. Drop your comments below. Tell us if you are more on the positive or the negative side, if you agree or you disagree about any of these points that we've brought up. Where does Tracy rank? Are you uh, one of those people that thinks that she's far and above the best Bond girl? Or are you somebody who's like, eh, Bond's got a better love interest here and there with other people or, you know, um, anything. Yeah, drop a comment. And since we overall went through this whole film and this is the longest one that we've done so far by a long stretch, it's two hours, 20 minutes right That's now. That's already my fault, really, for going over there. <laughs> nah, no, it's, it's mostly mine. Um the uh the only thing left to do is to do some plugs so if you are checking out everything on fanboysanonymous.com you should see some other things that are outside of the bond franchise that are taken care of here whether it's on the uh the superhero spectrum or it's somewhere of a video game type of thing or something you click around you'll find some stuff so if you subscribe and you follow the facebook and twitter accounts and everything you'll see that happening there if you are more into the pro wrestling side of stuff go to smartoutmoment.com and you will check out everything else that's happening there. See a podcast that we do multiple times a week. Check out the live coverage of different events and the editorial perspectives and the triple threat and all the other kind of things we got going on there. So go to smartcapmoment.com, follow that, share all those things, like all those things, follow all those things, subscribe to all those things, blah, blah, blah. And if you are still on the more pro wrestling side of things and you want to check out what these guys got, they've got a lot of things elsewhere and some part of the mix with that too. Rob? Uh, yeah, so if you're really into the pro wrestling side of things, you should be checking out Fightful.com and Fightful Select. Sean Ross Sapp is always working overtime to get very, very sourced scoops that are genuine and aren't just a bunch of guesswork and bullshit. So check out Fightful Select. Check out Fightful.com. There's an uh, interview I did with M. Dickey of M. Dickey Games. He is an independent game developer. I got to talk to him about his most recent release, Wrestling Empire, so check that out. You can also check me out on WrestleZone.com. You can also check out what I'm doing with Callum Wiggins on the Paul Hannon Smackdown podcast. Callum, what we got coming up on the next one, if there is one, because I forgot that these <laughs> air earlier, and that might be over. But if it is over, there is a whole archive and playlist. Tell them about it, Cal. This one will be yeah. coming out around March 5th. Yeah, yeah so this, yeah, so we, this will be over <laughs> by that point. But if you have missed it, there's obviously the Paul Hammond's Back Down podcast where me and Rob went back to the years 2002 and 2003. We checked out every single episode of SmackDown that Paul Hammond was the head writer for. So, yeah, there's an entire archive on smartcamoen.com. Check out the YouTube channel. There's a full playlist there as well. So you can watch all 37 or so episodes that took place. So check all those ones out. We also we also do like special editions, one on the smartcamoen.com, smartcamoen Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash smartcamoen, where we just um, talk about all the different pay-per-views that took place as well. So if you're at the $10 tier or above, then you can check those out as well. Um you can uh, what, read all the articles on smartcamera.com. Power rankings is my usual contribution, but there's plenty of other stuff for you to get your eyes around there as well. And you can follow me on Twitter at Wigmeister14. You can check out all the things that I'm going and doing and putting out there and publishing and whatever else is happening. <laughs> yeah, those uh, Yeah, all those things at Tony Mango on Facebook and Twitter. And everything else you'll just see when you're clicking around. So hopefully you enjoy all that stuff just as much as you enjoyed this. Hopefully you did enjoy this. <laughs> if not, you spent two and a half hours uh, listening to us ramble and got mad about it. But, you know, you're going to have to strap yourselves in because we're going to get kooky with the next one because this podcast will return with Diamonds Are Forever.